Don't bite the billionaire. By Helen Allen. Tis the strumpet's plague to beguile many and be beguiled by one. Shakespeare, Othello. Chapter 1. I watch, smirking, as the billionaire's personal assistant runs towards the door and wrenches it open. You're crazy! Mr. Barrington will hear of this, she shrieks as she sprints as fast as her heels allow down the palatial steps and onwards to where she's parked. She turns when she reaches her little red sports car, and I narrow my eyes and pretend to lurch forward. Screaming, she dives into her vehicle and roars off up the street. I turn and survey the room, shaking my head at my reflection as I catch it in the huge gilt mirror positioned to throw back the light from the chandeliers and illuminate the whole foyer. You dickhead, I remonstrate myself. You just lost the biggest client you've ever had. Christ, the others are going to be so mad. Making a quick scan of the house, I ensure all the rooms are secured, and everything is as neat as I found it, before locking the front door behind me. Just as I turn the key and finish punching in the security code, my phone rings. I don't recognize the number, but unusually for me, I answer rather than letting it go straight to voicemail. Serena Danube speaking. This is Christopher Barrington. Oh, fuck. I opt for a pretend I don't know the reason for his call, bright voice. Hello, Mr. Barrington. I just finished up with your PA. Yes, I heard. Oh. I understand you threatened to rip her head off and hang it on your Christmas tree. I don't hear any humor in his restatement of my threat, even though if you ask me, it was kind of funny. What I'd actually said was that if she spoke to me in a condescending tone again, I'd rip her little blonde Botoxed head right off and hang it by its fake extensions as a bauble on my Christmas tree. Still, I guess he'd got the gist. I know there's no point in apologizing. He's most likely calling to tell me he plans to destroy my career and that I'll never work in this town again. Best to just let him get it off his chest. Ah, uh, something like that. Clearly having my PA as an intermediary isn't working for either of us. Set up some viewings, and I'll spend tomorrow afternoon inspecting. It's the only time I'm going to give you, Miss Danube. Make it count. I raise my eyebrows in surprise that I'm being given another chance. Thank you, Mr. Barrington. I'll meet you tomorrow at my office, say 6 p.m.? No, you'll meet me at my office at 2 p.m. Mr. Barrington, there's a reason my business is called Twilight Viewings. I conduct my work in the evening and nights. It's what my clients want. It's not what I want. Be that as it may. Are you saying you don't want my business, Ms. Danube? I wrinkle my nose and allow my fangs to descend as my mind goes into overdrive. Fuck, 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 that's just it. I do need his business. This one job could set my friends and I up for at least one more lifetime. It could help make us safe. He's the client I've been waiting for for years. No, Mr. Barrington. I'm simply saying we could perhaps compromise. Do you think I've reached the heights of the business world by compromising, Ms. Danube? He sounds almost bored as he says this, and I want to reach down the line and rip his condescending, rich face off. Very well, I'll meet you at 2 p.m. At my office? Yes. And bring your top three houses for me to view. I don't want to have to do this dance again. Yes, Mr. He hangs up, and I bare my teeth at the phone. Snarling, I squeeze it as though I could choke him through it. I'm surprised he's giving me another chance, or maybe he just wants to treat me like shit in person for the afternoon to teach me a lesson. Rich men, powerful men, actually, all men, they always want to show their power, show they're the stronger sex. Hasn't it been this way for centuries? And hadn't I promised myself that I'd be the powerful one in future? But money. It came down, as it always did, to money. He has it. I don't. And I need it. Power, though, there are many types, and I'm far more powerful than ordinary women. Mr. Up himself prick just better not try to see how far he can push me, or he might receive a very salient lesson in how to compromise. Still, I shrug. Evil contemplations aside. If this is my last chance to sell him a house, I really had better try to be on my best behavior. Note to self, don't bite the billionaire, don't bite the billionaire.
Oh, and don't bite the billionaire. Chapter 2 The interrogation begins as soon as I get home. Tell me you didn't kill the PA? I screw up my nose and flop onto the sofa, rolling my eyes. I didn't kill her, Charlotte. Oh, for God's sake, Serena. What did you do to her? Tell me you didn't lose this client. You know I'm relying on decorating his future home to get my foot in the door with more high-end customers. I've told you a dozen times that I'm counting on you to work with him to give my interior design business the cash injection it really needs. Another voice shouts at me from the third bedroom down the hall. We're all relying on you securing this one. We need the money. I sigh as I watch Charlotte scrunch up her golden hair in agitation and roughly pull it into a messy bun on top of her head. In front of her are interior design style boards in a range of colors, from rich reds to pale creams. She scowls at me before picking up a cream velvet snippet of fabric and holding it against the tiny square of red carpet pinned to one of the boards. I haven't lost the client yet, Charlotte. I'm meeting him tomorrow in a last ditch effort to find the perfect home for him. We've agreed his PA wasn't working out for either of us. Did you break her arms? No. I roll my eyes. Don't act so shocked. You know as well as I do that you've been known to do exactly that when you lose your temper. Okay, well, this time I didn't. Well? I just threatened to snap off her head and use it to decorate the tree. Oh, for the love of... But I didn't actually do it. So you can see there's a definite pattern of improvement here. I start to giggle. She sighs and throws a design board at me as I dodge and turn for the kitchen in search of a blood bag. We'll have to hunt soon, though. I mumble around the straw, returning to the lounge. Prue wanders out from the bedroom and nods. Yes, we're low on bags. We either need to make a raid on a Red Cross interstate or catch a few sippies. If you're open to suggestions, I have a long, long list from my latest event. I shrug. Charlotte nods. Usually, Prue likes to eat the morally corrupt. She comes into contact with plenty of them in her florist and funeral planning businesses, which she's more conservatively named Night Bloom's Eternal. Taking out people who swindle poor relatives, cheating husbands who buy flowers for their girlfriends while beating their wives, those kinds of people are the ones she marks. It suits me. They usually get what they deserve. Although, to be fair, I don't really care who I drink as long as they're not obviously good people or children. If push comes to shove, none of us has the largest to be picky. There have certainly been times when we've had no choice. Charlotte's of the same mind as me. She'll pretty much drink anyone. But Tess is the one with the conscience. She prefers drinking from fresh stiffs at the hospital morgue and blood bags. Every now and again, she falls off the wagon, drains someone, and goes through a period of self-loathing. But not often. Her misguided guilt is, as far as I can see, her only fault. I, on the other hand, have many. Thinking of our fourth housemate reminds me I haven't seen her for a few nights. Where's Tess? Said she had some errands to run. Prue takes the bag from me and sucks hard before wiping her lips and handing it back. But I think she's doing another course at the community college painting this time. She won't be okay with whoever we choose. Charlotte grimaces as she stacks up her mood boards, setting them aside. Are they local, Prue? Ontario? Jesus, another flight. We can't afford to keep flying across the border, hitting the marks you choose. Let's hunt local tonight. We can afford to fly and take down your corrupt sippies if I secure this sale. If you secure this sale, we're leaving this backwater for good. Prue rolls her eyes. No, we're not. We agreed we'd stay here as long as we're the only vampires in town. You know as well as I do that establishing Serena's business is going to take time, as is establishing yours and mine. I don't want to be a funeral planner forever. It'll be at least 20 years, though, before we move on this time. Charlotte scowls. I know, but a girl can dream. At least if Serena gets this client, we can afford a new house with tight security, new offices, and regular flights to hunt and I might be able to take some time off to study, too. Either way, I shrug. No harm in preying on the locals for a little while, as long as we're discreet and careful. Charlotte frowns. Speaking of being careful, what time are you meeting this billionaire? 2 p.m. Not good. Dangerous territory. Don't I know it? I don't know how I'm going to stay awake. 
Plus, I'm meeting him at his fancy office uptown. I'll need a driver. It'll have to be Tess. I'm working. I'm busy too. Doing what? I snort. Planning ahead on the off chance you don't screw up. Decorating mansions with hundreds of rooms isn't something I just come up with overnight, you know. You said he wanted a house with a minimum of 50 rooms, a theater, a helipad, the works. Styling something like that takes time to pull together. Christ. I roll my eyes at her serious expression. I'm going out to hunt. You guys do what you like. If you see Tess before I do, tell her she has a job tomorrow. Just remember, you haven't secured this client yet. We might need to stay in this town a while longer than we anticipate. Don't kill anyone local. Yeah, yeah, sure. Of course, I don't tell them that I absolutely intend to kill someone local. There's a little PA with my name written all over her. Chapter 3 Is this it, Tess? I screw up my nose as I crane to see through the heavily darkened car windows at the skyscraper we're idling in front of. Its windows reflect the still bright sunlight like a million lasers shooting in different directions. A million deadly lasers to a vampire. This is the address. Tessa's expression reveals the concern she has for me trying to make it out of the car, across the crowded footpath, and into the building without being fried. She needn't have tried to hide it. I'm as worried as hell. I'm just going to make a run for it. I meet her eyes in the rearview mirror and grimace. But just as I put my hand on the door, my phone rings. Sighing in relief, although I know it can only be a short reprieve, I pull out my phone and frown. Mr. Barrington. I'll have to meet you at the first house. Oh? I've been held up in a meeting. I won't be able to leave for another hour. Very well. I try to sound a little miffed, but also polite, when in reality I'm doing cartwheels inside. I had no idea how I was going to get into his fucking building without smoke coming out of my ears. Although really, an apology wouldn't have killed him. I might, though, if he keeps this shit up. I'll meet you there and we can travel together to the next two houses. My driver will drop you back at your office after I've viewed all three. Okay. I'll need the address, Ms. Danube. His voice sounds droll and I feel my fangs extend a little as I start to feel annoyed. The address is 103 Scallion Way, Forest Field. On the mountainside? I can almost hear the disapproval in his question, and my fangs descend further as I frown. His PA hadn't said anything about mountains being out of the question, and it was the most exclusive area in this city. God, she was a useless bitch. Delicious, though. I focus back on what he's saying. Yes, the mountain. Is that an issue? Just don't be late. He hangs up. Me late? Me late, asshole? I snort as Tess laughs quietly in the front seat. Relieved? Yeah, but seriously, to tell me not to be late when he's just fucking called to say he's running late? The rich are the rich. They set the rules. They don't live by them. She shakes her head and pulls out into the stream of traffic. I can get you there in plenty of time and you can make sure the house is light tight. I nod as we head out. The traffic is bad, though, and I'm only just dropped off near the grand entrance of the imposing building, Tess making her way back down the long driveway, when a black limousine enters the large double wrought iron gates. Fortunately, the imposing building behind me is casting a shadow and preventing me from suffering direct sunlight. My black hat, black gloves, long sleeve shirt and pants are also offering maximum protection. I decide, on balance, to stand where I am, in the shade of the portico, and let him come to me, rather than walking down into the light and greeting him as he first arrives. Taking a deep breath, I watch as Mr. Barrington steps out, and I take off one glove in preparation to shake his hand. But as his foot hits the paved driveway, and he looks up to meet my eyes, all thoughts of handshakes go out the window as the wind blows and I receive a blast of his aftershave and more. His blood. Gasping, I turn and reel towards the door. He smells so divine. Irresistible. It's been a long time since I've met one of these. I want to tear off his clothes and eat him right here against his limousine. I don't care about the chauffeur. I don't care about the security cameras or the fact that he's an important client. I want him. I have to have him. 
My most important client to date, and he's irresistible. It's a blood call, almost impossible not to answer. Fuck, fuck, fuck. My fangs descend, and I begin to pant as I cast a quick glance back at him and see him staring up at the house. I know I'm about to lose control. Gasping, I punch the security code into the front locking mechanism of the huge double timber doors and step quickly into the cool interior of the foyer. I only have a few seconds to get myself under command before he mounts the steps and enters the door. But those few ticks of the clock save his life. When I turn to shake his hand, my fangs are retracted and my thirst is under wraps. Just. You have an interesting way of welcoming a client, Miss Danube. I look into his eyes. Whatever else he's going to say falters on his lips, and I almost want to ask him what the hell he's staring at as a frown crosses his brow and his lips press firmly into a disapproving line. Even angry, he's the most delicious man I've ever seen. I feel all my senses come alive again, and I move quickly to extinguish my bloodlust. In the old days, there were only two outcomes from meeting someone like this. They died, or they were turned into one of us. But since neither myself nor any of my friends had turned someone, would ever turn anyone, those we found irresistible usually always met a dismal end. Walking away from him, I turned to the large, wall-length mirror near the grand, imposing staircase. I apologize if my greeting struck you as rude, Mr. Barrington. I remove my other glove and my hat slowly and take a deep breath. But at least I was on time. I glance at his reflection in the mirror and see his eyes narrow at my obvious jibe. Are you deliberately trying to annoy me, Miss Danube, or does it just come naturally? I can see why my PA had an issue with you. Your PA, I snort and turn to him, all vampish tendencies under control, was ill-equipped to choose a house for you. She wasn't choosing a house. He turns from me making his way through the double French doors into the first room of the mansion. She was making a list, narrowing down my options. Now, however, she's taking a few days off. Stress leave. He turns and raises an eyebrow at me. I imagine I won't hear from her for at least a week. I don't bother telling him that it might be a little longer, actually. I snort. Pardon? I feel my tenuous hold on my anger snap. I guess I just lost the billionaire contract. Better to cut my losses now, before I do something I'll regret, like drain him dry. Mr. Barrington, let's cut the crap. You don't want to look at this house. If you had, you would have stopped to study the outside longer before walking in. You came here to berate me for threatening your staff. On the contrary, Ms. Danube, I assure you, I have no intention of spending my valuable time berating anyone. I'm looking for a house, a home, and despite your unusual temperament, I was told you're the best. I take a deep breath and study him, cocking my head to the side. God damn, he's gorgeous. I want to suck him and fuck him so badly. I take a step back. Well, you obviously don't want to live in the mountains. What makes you say that? I could hear it in your tone when I told you where I was taking you. Perceptive. He nods. Where do you think I might like to live, Miss Danube? With most clients, I don't take them to see houses straight away. I frown. I meet them for a drink or a coffee in their current home so I can get to know them. I ask what they really want and discern what they really need. I haven't had that chance with you. He sneers. Are you asking me on a date, Miss Danube? Don't kill him, don't kill him, don't kill him. No, Mr. Barrington, believe it or not, you're simply not my type. He raises his eyebrow at this, clearly disbelieving. Arrogant prick. Truth be known, he's right on the money, but not for the reasons he thinks. We, vampires, are drawn to particular types, not often. But when we are, it's virtually impossible to resist. It's only my sheer desperation to secure his money, and the fact that, given his wealth and position in this town, his death would not go unnoticed and might draw unfriendly eyes, that's enabling me to spare him. Then again, I'd had a few centuries to get my thirst under control, when I really had to. A younger vampire, though, like Tess, she just wouldn't be able to do anything about it. She'd repent later, of course, but her hunger would win out. Only one in a million men could make me feel the way this man does. 
I shake my head, ignoring his arrogant belief that he's irresistible and plow on. No, I am suggesting, however, Mr. Barrington, that had you met with me originally, rather than sending your PA, we might be further down the track to finding you your forever home. Or my head might be hanging from your Christmas tree. He smiles sardonically. It's still a few months until I put my tree up. I smirk. So that could happen. But jokes aside, I don't know enough about you to truly understand your desires. My desires? He runs his fingers along the marble mantle of the huge fireplace, and once more meets my eyes in the reflection of the giant mirror above it. Why don't you tell me what you think my desires are? If I didn't know better, I'd say he was being deliberately seductive with that tone. Or maybe all his tones are capable of making my bones turn to jelly. God, fuck, I want him. I shake my head and get down to business. You're a powerful businessman, obviously. You work in the city. You are, according to your ditzy PA, single, and therefore likely to want to go out evenings. I'd suggest you might be better off with a condo. No. Then I'm going to need more information. He turns from the mirror and looks at me, his eyes not dropping from mine, although I know few men who can hold my stare for long. Yes, you will. Chapter 4 Tess looks confused as she stands in the doorway watching me as I lean in close to the bathroom mirror, putting the finishing touches on my makeup. What do you mean, he wouldn't look at the houses? I stare at my reflection. I'm gorgeous without cosmetics, and my skin's flawless. But I do tend towards the unnaturally pale side, and foundation helps alleviate that. Then again, I snigger as I turn from the mirror. I'm technically dead, and no amount of makeup will change that. We agreed I needed to get to know him so I could figure out what he really wants. Charlotte growls from the lounge. But his PA told you. Fifty bedrooms, theater, helipad, stables, the works. I hear her once more throw her design boards to the floor in the room next door, and I know she's going to explode in anger if I don't calm her down. This is the problem with my kind. We're mercurial creatures. Our tempers and hungers are never far from the surface, and some of us have thinner veneers of civilization than others. Tess is the Zen master, and Prue, well, Prue's a redhead, and you just never know what you're going to get from one day to the next. I'm the most volatile, of course, but Charlotte comes a very close second. Calm down, Char. I walk next door and place my hands on her shoulders, pushing her back down into her seat. Picking up her mood boards, I place them carefully beside her near the cushions. I'll get you your design job. I'll sell this arrogant bastard a house, and we'll all have enough money to live in style, comfort, and the best security money can buy for a very long time. Tess sniffs. I'm so sick of living in this place without any space, without even a backyard to plant a flower. There's not even any room for the cats to roam. Poor Scruffy's taken to trying to get in the lifts every time I leave. He's so bored. She follows me in and flops down on the couch right on top of one of Charlotte's boards. Ditto, I add, perching on the arm of the couch. As soon as we're no longer poor, we'll move. I'll find you somewhere the cats can roam and you and Prue can garden. Garden smartin. Prue pipes up. We deserve a break. We deserve the opportunity to rest rather than constantly running and hiding. This asshole's money is the key to that. But Serena, we're not poor. She snorts from where she reclines, painting her toenails an iridescent green. We're the working middle class. Ugh. Charlotte shudders. I certainly will never be middle class. Have never been, will never be. Let me remind you, Char. Prue laughs. That we once worked as swineherds. You did. Charlotte rolls her eyes. And only out of sheer desperation and penury, but I was a nanny. A house servant, I grin at her, and I was a whore, which of course was the preferable of the three. Oh, Serena. Tess shakes her head at me. You never preferred it. You sacrificed yourself for us. Don't ever say something like that again. I shrug. What's past is past. None of us wants to have to sink into the depths of depravity we once endured to survive. It's not the 1600s anymore. And none of us wants you-know-who to find and kill us. Tess pales and Charlotte nods. So, you better secure this billionaire, and no more insulting him. Mmm, 
I'd like to secure him to a bedpost as I... And definitely no biting him. I purse my lips. I'll try. I frown. But how many of us have ever managed to resist one of them? Tess looks down, contrite, biting her lip. Forget it, Tess. I shake my head. I was just trying to make a point. I'm so sorry you have to go through this. Tess, I smile and reach over to hug her. It'll be okay. I know what you're thinking, so just stop. But you didn't bite him. She shakes her head. You're so strong, but me, I'm weak. So weak. No, I smirk. I've just delayed my gratification. I fully intend to suck him dry the moment the ink dries on the huge fucking check he's going to write me. Charlotte giggles, and Prue shakes her head. But I see a glimmer of a smile on Tess. She's right. I am strong. I have to be. For me. For all of us. I'm the oldest. I'm the glue that holds us together and always have been. But she's also giving me a lot more credit than I deserve. All of us had been in the presence, at least once in our long lives, of someone irresistible. Someone whose blood was, for some unknown reason, calling to us. None of us had been able to stop trying to kill them. My last one had managed to escape me. Charlotte had found one when she was a very new vampire and ate him. Prue had almost lost her life pursuing hers, but eventually drained him. And Tess, she too, had met one. They were thankfully few and far between, because for some reason the killing was easy. But unlike most of our meals, we remembered them long after we'd drained them. And we regretted what we'd done. Joking aside, I don't want that feeling again, at least, not now. I return to the bathroom to look at myself in the mirror, turn left, then right, and shrug. My ass is great. This dress, skin tight and dark green, just accentuates it. Do I look okay? I murmur to the girls as I wander back into the lounge area and pick up my work folder. Business-like but hot. Slutty, but that's a nice color on you. Says the woman who wears camouflage pants with singlets. I poke my tongue out. You know you look amazing. Tess rolls her eyes. You're divine. Divine. I raise an eyebrow. Oh yeah, I'm a perfect little angel. You need to be tonight. I hope I don't let them down. If yesterday was anything to go by, it's going to take every inch of my self-control to meet with him tonight and not eat him. I'll be good, I promise them as I walk out the door. But I reiterate it to myself as I get into the taxi. I'll be good. I won't bite the billionaire. Chapter 5 His house is huge, ostentatious, and pale pink. Even this late at night, it's lit up like the 4th of July. I snort as the taxi pulls up. This much flashy, over-the-top wealth is not what I expected from him. When he told me his current address, I hadn't been surprised at the area. It was favored by the wealthy. But his home, surrounded as it is by high walls, impervious to prying eyes, and featuring security that would do Fort Knox proud. This is nothing like what I'd expected. Pink? Really? Pale pink, sure. But pink? Walking up the wide front steps towards the front door, I feel a light spray on my bare shoulders from the replica Rococo fountain taking up the middle of the circular driveway, and I shiver. Who the fuck would want a gold statuette of a cherub pouring water onto dancing dolphins in their front driveway? Finding this prick a house just became a thousand times more difficult than I thought it was going to be. Is he gay? Christ. Typical, I'm attracted to someone as I haven't been for hundreds of years, and he's a pillow biter. My inner grumbling is interrupted as I ring the doorbell and hear the chime. It's a loud and squeaky version of a classical tune, and I shake my head and snort. Definitely gay. Something displeases you, Ms. Danube. The familiar droll voice echoes near my ear, and I jump as I realize it's coming from a small intercom located in the portico near the door. I see immediately that it has a video screen attached. If I'd known I was being watched, I would have been more circumspect in my reaction to the monstrosity of a house I now stand before. I wonder what my face must have looked like for him to ask me this. I take a deep breath before answering. 
Not at all, Mr. Barrington, I reply smoothly. I was merely trying to recall which tune your doorbell was playing. You'd make a poor poker player, Miss Danube. The door's open. I frown as I put my hand to the large brass handles and shove. I'm actually an excellent poker player. Stepping into his foyer, I try to keep my face neutral. His ostentatious taste in decor really is as awful as his taste in architecture. Maybe I should do the design world a big favor and just eat him now. There's no way in hell Charlotte's going to be able to decorate a house for this idiot, even if I do sell him one. She'd vomit up her last victim just stepping into this foyer. I smirk as I think this and catch his eye as he walks down the stairs, crystal whiskey tumbler in hand. He's wearing jeans and a light gray, long-sleeved shirt that hugs his muscles. It's made from some kind of stretchy, soft material that makes me want to reach out and stroke the hard pecs beneath. He's what I'd describe as thoroughbred muscular, lean yet tight and hard, wide shoulders, narrow hips and defined thighs. I'd guess he was a horse rider just from his legs and the way he walks, even if I didn't already know he was. I swallow hard and hope to hell I can pull off tonight. The more I see of him, the more I like. I'll bet his butt cheeks are so tight you could bounce a coin off them. His gay butt cheeks, I remind myself. You like what you see? He waves his hand around the richly garish foyer complete with antique French furniture. I pull my eyes away from the apex of his thighs, to the room around me. For a second, just a second, my brain is in charge, and my lips almost form the words I guess he wants to hear. But that second passes too quickly for my mouth to keep up, and instead I blurt what I'm thinking. It's hideous. I shake my head and sigh. His laughter is the last thing I expect, and I stand unsure as it booms down the stairs and echoes around the foyer. Yes. His chuckles subside as he reaches the bottom stair. I think you and I might be able to work together after all, Ms. Danube. Chapter 6 I sit on the edge of the antique French toil chair and listen to him speaking on the phone in the library next door. A call had come through as we walked through to this large, garishly furnished sitting room. He told me to make myself comfortable as he answered his mobile and walked next door. Comfortable? If I wanted to make myself comfortable, I'd sink my teeth into that gorgeous neck and fill my stomach with his blood. But even as I think this, I know he's safe for tonight. I'd fed again this evening before I made my way here, just to be sure I was completely satiated before our meeting. Usually I only drink once a week if I have a full body to drain, more if I'm relying on blood bags. So far this week I'd already killed twice. I wonder if my appetite is unusually ravenous due to his proximity. He smells so wonderful that I have to stop myself from unconsciously licking my lips around him. At least knowing he prefers men means I can stop also lusting after his body, maybe a little, because there's no chance his train is pulling into my station anytime soon. Focusing back on the now, I hear a tone in his voice that makes me frown. Sad? Disappointed? I don't have much time to ponder as I hear him place the phone down, and I listen to his footsteps on the carpet as he heads back my way. His face is impassive as he enters the room. Had a look around? Yes, this room at least. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that I don't want this. He waves his hand around to indicate the entire space. Understood. I rise, frowning. His mood has changed from when I first arrived. He'd been more relaxed then. Now he's angry. I'll arrange for some viewings within the next couple of days. I add, picking up my folder and making to leave. I'll show you a variety of styles and locations in and around this suburb. No mountainsides. Are you going? I had the feeling you wanted to be alone, I shrug, and I think I have all I need for tonight. What makes you think I want to be alone? He walks to the sideboard and pours another whiskey, his back to me, and I can't help but admire his physique. Oh, that ass. Regardless, I make for the door. I'll contact you in a few days. Regardless? He spins to me. Ms. Danube, if you mean to tell me you have enough information to go on to find me a home based on a brief look in a sitting room and on our short conversation to date, then I'm afraid you're very much mistaken. Mr. Barrington.
I meet his gaze steadily. I simply meant to give you some time to yourself. Someone of your... I grapple for the word. Responsibilities. Must get very little time to himself to relax. I don't want to take up any more of your valuable leisure time than I need to. Very tactful. He walks towards me and hands me the tumbler. But also untrue. He holds his hand up to forestall my rebuttal. And unnecessary. You'll stay as long as I say and do your job. I'll tell you what I want. Take notes. I clench my teeth to stop myself from telling him what I'm thinking. Notes? I'd like to throw this glass into the back of your head, you arrogant son of a bitch. Note that. I bite my lip. Try to control my sudden rage. He nods to the glass in my hand. Do you drink? Oh, he has no fucking idea. Obviously unaware of how he's pissed me off, he moves to pour himself a drink and goes on. I want three separate wings. He says as he walks from the sideboard to stare out the wall-length windows to the now dark grounds below. One for guests, one for family, and one for myself. I nod. It's fairly normal for gay men of means to host large numbers of their friends regularly. He wasn't the first I'd helped find a house. How many in the family? I ask, interested not only for room numbers, but out of curiosity. That's not of importance. Each wing will need a minimum of ten bedrooms. Private kitchen, fitness rooms, spas, saunas, theater rooms, the usual. It never ceased to amaze me that what these uber-rich people considered the usual was actually anything but for most people in the world. I wonder how he would go living in a hut with a dirt floor, fighting pigs for scraps, selling his body to soldiers for food. I shudder as I block out unwanted memories while he goes on. And I'll need a central focus for all three wings. Indoor pool, library, and gymnasium. The property needs to be extensive. I have horses to house, so, as you're already aware, stables and exercise areas are a must. I want separate buildings for my cars, and I'm sure I don't need to add... A helicopter pad. I nod. It all sounded pretty straightforward to me. Men like this had lots of toys. Shouldn't you be taking notes? I realize he's watching me in the reflection of the window. No need, I shrug. I have a photographic memory. Really? Then you won't mind repeating what I just said. On the contrary, I scowl. I have no intention of proving my memory or anything else to you, Mr. Barrington. The proof will be in the homes I show you next week. This week? I'll do my best, I reply through gritted teeth, ignoring his scowl. Christ, this man's getting under my skin. It's almost as though he wants me to kill him. Do I annoy you, Miss Danube? His voice carries an amused edge. I shake my head and breathe out slowly. Not at all, Mr. Barrington, I paste on a smile. I think you simply forget that not everyone works for you. But you do. He walks over slowly, standing before me and looking me in the eye. You do work for me, Ms. Danube. I shake my head. I'm an independent contractor. Contracted to work for me. Working for myself, undertaking business on your behalf. He stares at me for a full minute, not breaking my gaze. Once again, I'm surprised he's able to do so. My eyes don't hypnotize or do anything otherworldly but I know they usually frighten people. Normal people, that is. What's your heritage, Mr. Barrington? I ask to try and turn the conversation in a new direction. Where do your ancestors hail from? Will that help you find me a home? He quirks his lips. It will help me to better understand you, which can't hurt. I smile as I sit back down, crossing my legs and sipping my drink. I need to sit. If I keep standing in his proximity, where I can see the pulse in his neck, hear his steady, strong heartbeat, smell him. Well, I just don't think that will work out for much longer. Ireland. A few generations ago now, though. And I don't fancy living in a castle. Just in case you think I might. No, I shake my head. But you seem the type to prefer more natural surroundings than these. More, uh, masculine environs. I'm fishing, obviously, but it will be a hell of a lot easier to find what he's looking for if he tells me he wants something suitable for men, rather than both sexes. Was this house designed for you? 
Or were you under pressure to move in and haven't had the chance to redecorate? Under pressure. That's a diplomatic way of putting it. I wait for him to elaborate, and he takes his time. My ex-wife designed this home. I see. I nod. Ex-wife? Trophy wife to cover his other nocturnal activities, maybe? Not unheard of. What do you see? Many busy men leave the home decor and design to their wives. They don't always allow free reign in every area, but it's not uncommon. I didn't allow it in every area. I have my bedroom suite. Would you like to see that, Ms. Danube? Hell yes! My brain shouts. Uh-oh, hang on. Separate rooms? Definitely gay. No, I say quietly, standing once more. I don't think seeing his bedroom is a good idea at all. Although I'm very tempted to see if I can swing him to play for the other team right before I drain his life away. No harm in trying. He turns his head to one side, considering me, but doesn't comment, and I swallow hard. This is a man used to getting what he wants. I know all about people like him. But then, I'm also used to getting what I want. Mostly. I wonder momentarily if he'd been straight. If I might be able to sleep with him without killing him. But decide on balance? Probably not. He continues to stare at me but makes no move to stop me as I place my glass on his sideboard and turn to go. I really must go now. I'll be in touch, Mr. Barrington. My driver will take you home. I nod but don't look back as I leave the room. As I wait on the step for his chauffeured limousine to pull around, I clasp my hands firmly in front of me. I hadn't noticed how hard they were shaking until this moment. Chapter 7 Well? Three eager sets of eyes pin me as I walk in the door, cross to where they sit on the couch, and drop my satin wrap and folder onto the cushions. I didn't bite him. A huge sigh of relief escapes the trio. Have a little faith, I laugh, walking through to the kitchen and pouring myself a glass of wine. I down it in three huge gulps, re-pour, and walk back to the lounge, glass in one hand, bottle in the other. Do you think you can work together? Without, you know. I grimace at Tess as I top up their glasses. I'll have to. But fucking hell, it won't be easy. Any clues on a design brief? I have a little insight. I smirk, thinking back to the rooms of ostentatious French Rococo I'd endured this evening. He's quite obviously gay. Oh. Charlotte laughs. Well, you did say he was gorgeous, so that figures. Not all the beautiful ones are gay. Tess shrugs. Mostly, though. Well, anyway, Charlotte, I laugh. I'm thinking he needs timber and leather. Utilitarian yet comfortable furniture in natural colors. Light, lots of light, plants, water features. Think art deco lines with log cabin, Robinson Crusoe chic. Robinson Crusoe chic? Charlotte spits out her wine. Dear God. I laugh. I don't know. I guess I was thinking the opposite of what he's currently living in. It was clearly designed and decorated with someone else in mind. I don't think it suits him one iota. But I mean, who knows? Maybe he's all bluff and bravado in his business days, and then at night, he turns into a soft, cuddly little teddy bear who calls his bed buddy Daddy. I'll know for sure in a few days when I begin taking him to some homes. I'm basically going to try a range of styles completely the opposite of his current mansion. Who designed his current home? He claims it was all his ex-wife. I thought you said he was gay. Prue laughs. Make up your mind. I think it was just a marriage of convenience for reputation or money or something. He didn't share a bedroom with her. Oh, one of those kinds. Tess nods. That gives me nothing to go on. Charlotte rolls her eyes. You really need to pin him down on exactly what he wants. Oh, I'll pin him down all right. He wants all the bells and whistles, I frown, trying not to let my mind wander into the gutter, mulling over all the ways I'd like to pin him. Money's no object. That much is clear. As to style, I let out a deep sigh. It's just too soon to know. Anyhow, like I say, in a few days all will be revealed. I drain my glass and head to the shower. Standing under the cascade of hot water, I run over my visit with the billionaire. Everything from his words, to his body language,
to the way he held his glass in his long, artistic fingers. There's just something about Christopher Barrington that I can't stop thinking about. The sooner I find him a house, the better. Chapter 8 Dressed carefully in my customary tight little black dress, leather folder in hand, I await my client. This, the first house we're to visit, fits most of what I think he wants. It's situated happily on the edge of the city, but not on the mountainside. It's vacant at the moment, rarely used by its Russian owners, and has only been listed on the market for a few weeks. It has a much more sophisticated alarm and security system than his current home. I think it's a little ostentatious on the outside. It's a little overly decorated with carved details, but inside it's much plainer, much more masculine. I'm hoping he might like this one. Perhaps it'll appeal to both sides of his personality. As I wait, I nervously chew my lip and pass my weight from leg to leg. It's very dark now, even though it's only 6.30 p.m. The cold nights are setting in early. Winter's here, but it hasn't gripped fully. It's still fighting obstinate, intermittent autumn, making the ground muddy and slushy in the woodlands, and even the most well-tended gardens ugly. Now isn't the optimum season to be showing houses. Spring is the season I get the most sales and commissions. But Mr. Barrington isn't the optimum client. He's rich, sure, but pedantic in what he wants, mercurial in his moods, and so far, elusive. This is the third time I've scheduled viewings. Both previous times, he canceled at the last minute. I shiver as I hear an owl hoot from the trees nearby. These quiet, exclusive suburbs, if you can even call them that, given how few and far between the houses are, give me the creeps. But then again, that's because I know who or what likes to live in these areas among rich humans. And I know just what can go on behind high walls where no one can hear you scream. Still, I remind myself that my friends and I settled in this particular city because it's home to the rich. But it's also a city where we don't need to fear other types of inhabitants as we do in other, larger places. I know we'll be happy living here for the next few decades if we can just earn a little more money. Okay, a lot more money. Third time lucky, I murmur as I see a black BMW round the bend of the driveway. As he steps out of the car, I see he's wearing his suit and presume he's come straight from his office. Pausing with his car door open, he takes off his jacket and loosens his tie before throwing the jacket onto the driver's seat, slamming the door shut and looking up at me. I notice he has a three-day growth or perhaps less, maybe a day or two. Not shaving doesn't make him seem scruffy. It only accentuates his strong jawline. Christ, he looks like a magazine advert for Hot Rich Anything You Like. Working late? I smile. Always. He sighs heavily before taking the steps two at a time and coming to stand two steps too close to me. I'd wondered if you were going to cancel again, I murmur as I turn for the front door. I thought about it. I freeze. His voice had come from too close behind me. Mr. Barrington. I turn quickly and gasp as his chest bumps into mine. My apologies. He leans back slightly but doesn't make to step away. Clearly, he doesn't understand that the closer he is, the less likely he is to see tomorrow, let alone any other house. Most men, unless they're drunk or horny, usually don't stand so close to me. They sense something, a primal little lingering fear that they probably couldn't name if they had to. But this guy, who has more reason to fear than most, doesn't seem to feel it. Mr. Barrington, I start again, my voice firm. You seem to have an issue with personal space tonight. Please respect my private bubble. I draw a circle around myself in the air. Of course. His eyes flick from mine to my lips and back again. His own lips quirked in a sardonic smile. I gulp. Any other man, any other time. Turning quickly, I lead the way inside. The lights are already on. I switched them on earlier, and it's just a case now of giving an outline of the property's features and showing him the rooms he might be interested in seeing. But once he steps inside and shuts the door, the feeling of being alone with him, all alone in this massive, beautiful home, somehow goes from showing a house to an illicit rendezvous. I'm hyper-aware of his body, his breathing, his smell. It's as though we're two naughty trespassers. 
I shrug off my almost impossible to resist urge to launch myself at him and tear his clothes off, instead pasting on a bright smile as he studies my face, quirking an eyebrow. Sometimes it feels wrong to be in these houses at night, I joke. Goldilocks syndrome? He smiles. Only neither of us is blonde, and I don't particularly like porridge. Me either, I smile back. And there are 40 bedrooms, so that's a lot of beds to test until you find one that's just right. He chuckles as I realize that what I've said could be misconstrued. And flushing, I turn. The gymnasium's this way. I point down a long, wide marble hall and he indicates I should walk ahead of him. I set off, but I'm on edge. Why am I so nervous? Because he makes me feel like a schoolgirl on a date with the principal. It's not just his money. There's something powerful about him, strong, unattainable. He follows without question, but I'm so aware of him, right behind me, that every hair on my arms has risen. Entering the gymnasium, he walks away from me, studying the various aspects of the side rooms, the storage areas, and the fencing platform. Whoever lives here obviously has a great love of a range of sports. I expect he'll find this attractive, manly stuff. There are huge stables at the rear of the property, too, which I'm sure he'll appreciate. I stay where I am as he tours, getting a grip on my emotions and my needs as he inspects the heated pool in the adjacent room and circles his way back to me. Do you like what you see? I wave my hand around, indicating the room. I'd like to see more. He doesn't take his eyes off me. I nod and lead the way. His words seem heavy with double meaning but I must be imagining it. Wishful thinking. As I point in the direction we need to go next, his phone rings. Excuse me. He nods, signaling that I should leave to give him privacy, rather than him just walking away to talk. I turn around, roll my eyes, and stalk down the hallway. Insufferable jerk. Leaning against the wall, I flick through my brief on the house, making sure I haven't forgotten to give him the cell on anything else I think he might like but my exceptional hearing doesn't allow me to concentrate. He's talking in low, cajoling tones, and once again he sounds sad. Straining my ears, I frown in concentration as I try to make out his words. Valerie, please, we've been over this. It's only one weekend in twelve. No, yes, I know. Because I'm your father, Valerie. Nothing else matters. You know your mother just says these things. Hang on. He has a kid? He's quiet for a minute, and I wonder what Valerie is telling him that makes him sigh so heavily. All right, sweetheart, if that's what you really want. No, I know I can't change your mind. No, fine. I'll see you at Christmas. I look down busily at the papers before me as I hear him click off his phone and walk my way, his lips set in a grim line. Please continue, Ms. Danube. If this is another bad time and you'd prefer a different appointment. What makes you say that? It's just that you seem angry again. I'm not angry with you, Miss Danube, far from it. Now, if you wouldn't mind. He waves his hand to direct me to continue. I tilt my head to indicate the direction we're heading in and lead the way up the stairs. I'm still very aware of his proximity as he follows me. If he was a straight man, he'd be checking out my fantastic ass right now. But I remind myself, he's not. Although he has a child, so there's a possibility he swings both ways, or did in the past. I steal my resolve. Even if he is in a shit mood, I need to question him more if I'm to truly know what kind of home he wants. Are you seeing anything in particular you like so far, Mr. Barrington? I ask as I continue up the stairs. Yes. I think I hear amusement behind his tone. Then the style of this home is what you're looking for. No. Sorry. I turn to him as we reach the top of the stairs and tip my head to the side, waiting for his explanation. It has some of the features I'm looking for, but not all. I want the house I buy to have everything I need, and everything my guests might need. I don't want to have to retrofit. I have neither the time nor the inclination to deal with dust and noise in my private life. I also want it to feel like a home. A single man's home has a very different feel to a family home, in my experience. He's quiet as we leave the landing and make our way to the extensive library. After a long few minutes of silence, as he peruses the floor-to-ceiling shelves, 
He clears his throat. I have a daughter, a 15-year-old. My ex-wife has custody, but I expect that once I'm settled, my little girl will stay with me regularly. The stables are as much for her as they are for me, as will be the house. I see. My brain is high-fiving, not gay. For some reason, I can't wipe the smile from my face. Why are you smiling like that, Miss Danube? He shakes his head as he walks towards me. Nothing. Ugh. It helps me to know a little more about you, that's all. Has my telling you I have a daughter given you some dramatic insight into my character? Yes. I thought you were gay. He stares at me for a full 30 seconds before bursting into laughter. Good God, do you always just blurt out what you think? Mostly yes, I shrug. It saves time. Well, Miss Danube, to save us further time. I am many things, but I can safely assure you that being gay is not something I've ever been accused of. Not that it would have been a bad thing, I hastily assure him, but design-wise and house brief-wise, it does make a difference. Are you telling me you chose this house because you thought I slept with men? No, I mean, well, it has more than your average saunas, gymnasiums, sports rooms, and the like, I shrug. And you assumed, given I live in a Rococo abortion at the moment, that I needed more manly surroundings. He shakes his head, chuckling. I wasn't sure. But since you said you wanted the antithesis of what you currently lived in, I had to assume... That I was a gay man who preferred the dominant side of the relationship? You have to admit, I shrug, you're no shrinking wallflower. That makes two of us, Ms. Danube. I laugh. Yes. I gather you have another house for me to look at tonight? I do. And will this one too favor the, shall we say, more gentlemanly pursuits you thought I was so inclined towards? Well, to be honest, yes. Robinson Crusoe chic was what I was heading towards. Fucking hell. He laughs. No. No? No. Then I guess I'll need to do a little more homework. Shall we say this time next week? Do you need a ride home? My mind fills in the blanks. Ride? Oh yes, I need that, but not the kind you're thinking of. I shake my head. No, I'll need to turn all the lights off and lock up. It could take some time. Thank you for the offer. Next week then, Miss Danube. He leaves without a backward glance, but I can still hear him chuckling as he walks down the long hallway and out the front door. Well, 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 I murmur as I lock up. Not gay. You just became a hundred times more irresistible, Mr. Barrington. At least when I thought I couldn't fuck you, there was a chance I could resist biting you. But now? How am I ever going to avoid biting this billionaire? Chapter 9 I brush my hair into a ponytail, twist and secure it as a bun, and pull a few tendrils down to hang either side of my face in becoming curls. Tonight, I'm wearing a cherry red knee-length skirt, cherry red stilettos, and a white business shirt with tiny diamante buttons. Charlotte smirks. Date or business? Business, of course. I frown. It's been three weeks. Every week you've shown him three houses, and every week he says no. I'm beginning to think you're deliberately showing him homes he won't like so you can stretch this out. Either that, or he just wants to spend more time with you. Charlotte! I half laugh. If you think I like spending time with an arrogant megalomaniac who constantly tempts me towards giving into my dark side, then you're crazy. Not sucking him is the hardest thing I've ever had to do. And no, there's no way he's enjoying my company. It's simply business for him, and most of the time he barely says anything to me. My conscience pricks. This is a total lie. I can't get enough of him, and we do talk quite a bit. If you say so. She rolls her eyes. But I've never seen you take this much care with your appearance for just any old client. He's not just any old client, though, is he? I snort. He's the client we all need me to win. Serena. Tess stalks towards the bathroom, her eyes furious. Are you responsible for any of this? She shakes the newspaper angrily at me, and I breathe deeply through my nose. I know what she wants to know. I can't blame her for thinking of me straight away. Two of them, yes. I sigh, 
pointing to two of the faces of the missing people photographed among a dozen or so of the homicides listed in this morning's paper. The rest? No. Probably not. Probably not? She gives me a disappointed look. Maybe one more, certainly no more than that, though. I straighten my shoulders defensively. I told you, I have to eat more than usual to avoid sucking the billionaire. You know how hard it is to resist these types. I know, but we all have to live in this city. You can't keep this up or we'll have to move. Money or no money. Prue frowns as she walks in sucking on a blood bag. You should know what killed them, Tess. You work in the fucking morgue. I do know what killed them. A whole range of interesting and inventive accidents, all of which involved heavy blood loss. Were they the usual types? Homeless bums, drug dealers, barflies, musicians, so yes. But nevertheless, we all need to be careful. I promise you I haven't eaten any musicians lately. I try not to scowl as I brush on more mascara. That much I'd remember. Then that means others have moved into the city. And that means we need to leave. Serena, you need to hurry up and seal the deal with this billionaire. Just get the money. Don't worry about me being his new interior designer. I can see this is harder on you than we all first thought. Get the commission and we leave. End of story. What if it's him doing this? Tess flaps the paper and looks as though she's going to pass out. None of us mention the name of the one she's referring to. It's not. I give her a hard stare. Everyone. Just be calm. We don't know that others are here. We've always stayed one step ahead of them, and will continue to do so. This town is ours. We're not leaving. And as for the billionaire, I'm trying. Believe me, I'm trying. Try harder. He needs to buy the next house. Okay. I let out a deep breath. Tonight will be the night, I promise. Ready, Tess? I'll be there to pick you up from the last house. And by last, I mean the sold house. Right, Serena? Right. Chapter 10. I walk through the home, room by room, switching on the lights and mulling over my conversation with the girls. I feel antsy tonight, a little nervous or something. And I wonder if it's this house, or if I'm just thinking back on our conversation over the unusual number of deaths being reported lately in this city. Usually, this would be our cue to leave. We never stay in a city inhabited by other vampires. It's just too risky. Too fraught with the possibility we'll be discovered by those whom we'd managed to avoid for a very long time. But this time, I'm confident they're not here. Not yet, anyway. I know this city. I know all the expensive homes, and I have access to the title and purchase information for pretty much any mansion in this city. Some of these homes might be creepy as hell at night, but humans own this market. Although, in my experience, humans could be just as vicious, if not more so, than vampires. And way scarier. There's every chance people in this city are being killed by other people, not paranormal beings. And if humans, not vampires, are taking up most of the real estate here, that means we can stay. But only if we can establish our businesses properly and live in a manner that will enable us to stay under the radar. I really need to make this sale. As to Charlotte's assertion that I'm deliberately not showing Mr. Barrington houses he might like, she's wrong. Her suggestion I liked spending time with him, though, is dead on the money. The more time we spend together, the more time I want to spend with him. He's like a drug. An annoying, up-himself, condescending, sexy as hell, rich and powerful beyond my wildest dreams. Drug. Hearing his car pull up in the driveway, I continue switching on lights while I wait for him to come in. I've left the front door wide open tonight. Ms. Danube? He watches me as I walk down the wide stairway. What is this, house number 10? I grimace as I make my way downstairs. He looks delicious again, dressed tonight in a white polo shirt and golf pants. The pants are checked in burgundy and cream with little gold lines in the cross hatching. On anyone else, they might have looked ridiculous. On him, they look amazing. I have a moment imagining him striding along the greens, pausing to swing his stick and sink a hole in one. I try not to smirk. I have a very dirty imagination. 
something like that, I nod. But I think this one has a great many of the features you're looking for, if you're prepared to compromise on a handful of others. Compromise is not in my nature. It's not lost on me that he's watching my legs as I continue to walk down the stairs, one careful high heel at a time. Life is compromise, I frown. Not mine. Well, at least take a look while you're here, I shrug as I reach the bottom of the stairs. If you don't like it at all, we have one other. But I've got to tell you, I've almost exhausted all the homes, listed and unlisted. We might have to turn to considering properties and builds. No. I shake my head at him and begin the tour. Once again, though, he walks too close to me as we head down another wide hallway towards another kitchen. They're all starting to seem the same to me, too, as does my spiel about its features and appointments. When we reach the island bench, he turns to me. I'm not interested in the kitchen. Oh, okay, what are you interested in seeing? The bedrooms. I'm surprised, but try not to show it. In nearly all of the houses we've toured over the past couple of weeks, he's most deliberately not wanted to see the bedrooms. And every time he said no, I've breathed a sigh of relief because throwing him down onto the nearest bed and having my way with him is something at the forefront of my mind. The fact that he's still breathing after so many weeks is a testament both to my strength of resolve and, I'm beginning to realize, to his unknowing decision not to go into those areas that might weaken that resolve. I take a deep breath. I see, all right. I turn to leave, but he's standing in my way. As I move to go around him, his hand snakes out and grabs my wrist, circling it with his long, cool fingers. Ms. Danube? I look down at his hand and back up into his eyes. Yes? These past few weeks trespassing on houses with you. Uh, inspecting, I swallow. Inspecting. I find I'm inspecting you more than the homes. Oh. And I'd very much like a closer inspection. I see. I stare back at him for a full second before my resolve completely crumbles. Oh, fuck it. Dropping my folder, I fall against him as he releases my wrist, grips my hair in one hand, my butt in the other, and slams my body into his, his lips claiming mine greedily. I respond to his forcefulness instantly, my nipples hardening, my hips pressing against his, as he backs me up and pushes me against the marble-topped kitchen bench, one hand still in my hair, the other now gripping and kneading my right breast. Having something firm behind me allows me to press even tighter into him. I grind my hips, feeling his instant, hard response. His mouth tastes divine, his body smells mouth-watering, and as I dig my nails into his hard muscles, I can't recall ever wanting anyone so thoroughly in every way imaginable. I moan into his mouth as his hand slips inside my shirt and bra, and his thumb brushes back and forth across my nipple. Taking his lips from mine, he trails kisses down my neck. And I feel my fangs begin to descend. I know I'm about to lose control. I will bite him. Bite him as he takes me here. Now, in the kitchen. His lips move up my neck to my ear, and his hands push up my skirt as he lifts me onto the bench in one smooth move, scooting me forward so my thighs can enclose his hips. And I know at that moment, as his fingers lightly brush over my damp, lacy underwear, that if I don't move, if I don't stop this, I'll kill him. Mr. Ah, Mr. Oh. I try to get the words out, but I'm gasping with lust, shivering with anticipation, my throat parched with sudden thirst. He moves his face down to my cleavage, one hand between my legs, the other deftly unbuttoning my shirt as he groans. You take my breath away. As he takes my nipple between his teeth, I moan, turning my head away so that he doesn't see my fangs as I take another deep, ragged breath. But that's the thing. I don't want to do that. Do what? His mouth moves from my breast and back up my neck. I grit my teeth and give him a slight push on the chest. He steps back immediately. Not looking at him, I jump down from the bench, pull down my skirt, and hastily look down, concentrating on rebuttoning my shirt before bending to pick up my folder. When I rise, my fangs are once again hidden. 
I think... I shake my head. I'm sorry. I think I gave you the wrong idea. Are you saying you don't want me to fuck you because that sure as hell isn't what your body's saying? No, ugh, yes. Ugh, no. I want to, but I can't. I'm sorry if I led you on in some way. I, we, this can't happen. His eyes turn dark. I understand. Good. Ah, uh, I hope, I hope this won't impact on our working relationship. He runs his hands through his hair before raising his chin and meeting my concerned gaze, his eyes radiating arrogance. This house won't do. But you haven't even seen a tenth of it, I start. I've seen enough. He turns from me and leaves the kitchen and the house. I stand silently, catching my breath, as I hear him close the front door and start his car, idling for a minute or two, before roaring down the driveway. What have I done? I moan as I walk quietly from room to room, switching off the lights. As the house darkens, wing by wing, I get that itchy, nervous feeling that I had when I first entered this place, and I put in a quick call to Tess to tell her to come and pick me up. I'd hoped to go from house to house with the billionaire and have Tess pick me up from the very last. But plans change. When I finally leave the house, Tess is waiting for me in the driveway, the engine running. This place gives me the creeps. It has that whole gingerbread house feel. Pretty on the outside, but no candy indoors. You got that right, I snap. Chapter 11 I sign the contract and smile at Mr. and Mrs. Sancini. I'm sure you're going to be very happy there, I say as I put the cap back on my pen and lean back in my chair. After a few more pleasantries, the pair make to leave, and I rise and walk them to the door, shake their hands, and give a wave as they enter the lift. It's not until the lift is on its way down toward the ground level that I turn and lean my head against the wall, breathing a sigh of relief. I hadn't sold them a mansion by any means, but it was a nice house in a wealthy suburb, and the commission would tide us over for another few months. It's hardly the billionaire commission, though, is it? My brain remonstrates me. I sigh and straighten up. It's been two months since my ill-fated kitchen lust with Mr. Barrington. He hadn't called to reschedule more viewings, and I hadn't called to see if he wanted to. The girls insisted I do, but I can't. Tess had shaken her head when I told her what happened on the drive home that night. He won't care that you didn't sleep with him. It'll all be fine and forgotten in the morning. But it wasn't. And while I'm sure he might have forgotten all about me by now, after all, what was I? Just a lowly real estate agent in a big, big city. I couldn't seem to forget him. I couldn't forget how his body felt against mine. How his hands knew my topography without having explored it before. How every cell in my body craved him. How his mouth quirked when he was amused. How it tasted. I just couldn't forget. Walking to my desk, I slumped down and put my head in my hands. Time to go home, see what my friends have been doing all night, and maybe plan our next sippy flight, now that I can expect a nice fat commission check in the coming days. Smiling, the first genuine smile in weeks, I take my hands from my face, prepared to rise and leave, when the lift bell dings. Frowning, I turn to see the billionaire step into my small, modest office. Ms. Danube. I watch him cross the short distance to my desk, my heart in my mouth. He's wearing jeans and a chunky fisherman-style knit sweater and dark navy. I swear my insides give a little jump of delight as the scent of his cologne hits me, followed by the scent of his blood. Mr. Barrington. Is this a bad time? No. I'm sure you're wondering why I haven't been in contact over recent weeks. No. No? You're a financially powerful man? I shrug and raise my chin to glare at him. Used to getting what you want. You didn't get what you wanted. End of story. He stares down at me silently for a minute, his eyes meeting mine, not flinching at my direct gaze. You're right, I usually do get what I want. He eases his large frame down into one of my less-than-comfortable client seats. But perhaps I don't always go about claiming it the right way. He pauses, looking me in the eye once more. I can see this is likely as close to an apology as he's given to anyone, perhaps specifically a woman, in a long time. 
Ms. Danube, I've spent the past few weeks on a ship with my little brother, cruising the seven seas, trying to unwind from business for a while. I've come back with a new vision of what I want, and I think you can help me find it. I see. I don't know what it is about you. Perhaps your brutal honesty. Perhaps that night in the kitchen. He pauses and purses his gorgeous lips. Whatever the case, I feel like there's something between us that should be explored. I'd like to get to know you a little better, if you'll let me. And I'd still like you to find me a house. Haha. <laughs> I inwardly do a little high-five to myself. Obviously, he can't forget that night, either. Mr. Barrington, I shake my head. I wasn't kidding the last time we met. I've shown you everything on my books that might come even remotely close to your brief. You need to build. He nods. I understand your frustration. I want to say, do you? Because frustrated is definitely the word that springs to mind when I consider your rock-hard cock pressed up against me on a kitchen bench. But I keep my mouth shut. I know you've already put in a great deal of work on my behalf. I'm prepared to pay you $50,000 for your expenses to date and an additional $50,000 in travel and time expenses if you'll accompany me on a short research trip. I try not to widen my eyes at the amount he's offering, and instead wave my hand for him to go on. To him, that amount might seem paltry, but to my friends and I, it would be life-changing. It occurred to me that if you came to my holiday home in Aspen, my favorite place, that you might get more of an idea of what I'm looking for. It might give you more of a feel for what I need. Wait, Aspen? I immediately think of blindingly white snow and me falling to the slopes like a crispy fried chicken. No, I'm sorry, I can't. I'm going there in a few days for Christmas. Mr. Barrington, I frown. Christmas is not customarily a time for work. I have commitments, family. Will a hundred thousand dollars cover your lost family time? Ugh, yes, yes, it will. Good. I'd like you to come as my guest. Separate bedrooms, of course. I won't cross the line again. Damn, there's a line? If so, I'm about to cross it big time. Mr. Barrington. It's Christopher. Christopher, I nod. You can call me Serena, and separate rooms will not be necessary. Chapter 12 You can't possibly be doing this. I can, and I will. But it's Christmas. Tess looks at me from where she sits curled on the lounge with her cats, wearing her fluffy red and white Christmas sweater with the words, Ho Ho Ho, stitched in green across the chest. We always spend Christmas together. Tess, I grimace. I'll make it up to you next Christmas, I promise. Imagine how great it'll be to celebrate in a new home. He's giving me another chance, a chance to get that commission. I'm not going to give it up. You're going to kill him. Prue shrugs as she sips her eggnog. I'm going to try very hard not to do that. I shake my head. But I'm definitely going to fuck him. I told you so. Prue nods to Charlotte and Tess. Didn't I tell you so? Serena, if you do that, you'll definitely suck him dry. Maybe. Maybe not. I shrug. I'm leaning towards not. So what? He's just going to pick you up, fly you to his holiday home in Aspen, and you're going to spend the days curled up in his arms in bed? Then you'll magically figure out everything he needs in a future home, return, find him one and what, go your separate ways. I frown and shake my head. To be truthful, I hadn't thought any further than the bedroom scenario. Because you can't have a future with a human, Serena. I'm sure I don't need to remind you of that. I know. I lean over to pick a lint ball from Tessa's jumper. Falling for this guy would be a bad idea, Serena. Charlotte flicks a concerned glance at Prue and back at me. I know, I whisper. Bad, bad idea. Are you? Falling for him, that is? I don't know. I've never felt like this before, I shrug. I don't know much about him. I mean, I'm drawn to his power, his strength. I want his body. I definitely want his blood. I don't think, no, I don't think I'm falling for him. I just want him. Then get it out of your system in Aspen. But be prepared to leave this place the moment you get that commission, and to leave him. I will, I nod. But even as I say this, 
I know it doesn't ring true. There's something more to this man. Something about the pain in his eyes when he gets off the phone from his daughter. Something about the way he looks at me when he talks to me. Something I find so irresistible about the quirk of his lips, the way he sardonically raises his eyebrow, his sense of humor. There's just, well, something. Shivering as someone walks over my grave, I paste on a smile and point to our tree. It's the biggest and best we've had in many years, covered in twinkling lights and baubles, not ahead of an enemy to be seen. Underneath, it's crowded with gifts. I'd had a little spending spree with the money Christopher had already deposited into my account, after I'd shaken off the feeling that I was, once again, selling my body for money. This money was paid, I'd reminded myself, for me to accompany him. He'd offered it before I'd suggested we should share a room. Therefore, it was paid for my mind, my business acumen, not my body. Once I'd reconciled this idea in my head, I'd enjoyed spending big on a range of gifts for my friends. Ladies, you cannot open your presents until Christmas morning. That includes you, Tess. I pretend to scowl at her. No rattling them or squeezing them either. Some are fragile. Tess smiles. You spoil us. Nothing could spoil you, Tess. I shake my head and give her a hug. Just be safe. Always. But even as I say this, I know going to Aspen might be safe for me, physically, but it's most definitely not the safest decision for my heart. Or for my billionaire. Chapter 13 He grimaces as he sips his whiskey. I watch him and sniff the strawberry champagne the flight attendant has handed me, allowing the bubbles to tickle my nose. I'm sorry about the detour. I lean back further into my seat and shake my head at him. Our seats, lounges really, face each other. They're the only two seats on the jet, although wide enough to seat four comfortably. A low, highly polished coffee table separates us. At the front of the jet is the cockpit and cabin crew area, screened by a sliding door. At the tail end is a bedroom, also screened. It's something I've been very aware of the entire flight, although now it looks like we're not going to be alone on this journey after all. She's your daughter, I shrug. Of course you should collect her. You said she's 15. Yes, just a little girl. Her mother normally couldn't care less if I sent my other private jet to collect her. She's just being a pain in the ass at the moment. Arguments over alimony? I smirk. I don't bother telling him that at 15 his daughter is hardly a little girl. When I was that age, I was, well, I wasn't a little girl anymore. I frown as my thoughts turn dark and listen carefully to what Christopher's saying. I like calling him by his first name. It rolls so nicely off my tongue. Not a chance. She took billions. No, my lovely ex-wife wants more than that. She still wants to punish me. That's why she's turning Valerie against me. He clams up, obviously annoyed that he's told me so much. Punish him? For what, I wonder? And what of your brother? I ask, as much to change the subject as to keep him talking. Will he be an Aspen? No, he's not interested in mixing business with pleasure. Unfortunately, it's an occupational hazard for me. Oh, this is not just Christmas? I wondered why you'd travel to a ski resort wearing a suit. Every year, a range of my closest business partners and contacts fill the lodge with their friends and family. He sighs, turning to look out the window. It gives us a chance to network without taking any real downtime. The wives use the time to shop and compare clothes and whatever else women do. Ah, so I really am coming along for work. I smile over my glass but wish I'd worn something more professional. Instead, I'm wearing a tight, red-knit dress with tiny white pom-poms around the low-cut V-neck and along the hemline that runs just above my knee. But it was kind of a thing among my friends and I to dress Christmassy at this time of year, sing carols, and decorate cookies to give away. We all went all out for the holiday season. Plus, the dress was a gift from Prue, and it made her happy to see me wear it. And let's be honest, I look amazing in it. Work? That depends. His eyes drift to my ample cleavage and meet mine, his own, filled with promise. Once more, I feel my body respond to him. Just a look, and I'm melting inside. Dear God, my mind shouts, rip my clothes off and take me now. 
I take a sip of my drink and meet his steady gaze. And so you and your brother are both self-made tycoons? How? If you don't mind me asking, how did you make your bazillions? Not self-made entirely. I took over the family's oil business. My brother took over the property portfolio. But we've both, in our own ways, expanded them exponentially. Oil, huh? I nod as though this is an everyday conversation, causing him to smirk. What I really want you to do while you're here is to take a good look around the lodge. Because of all the places I live, this is the one I feel most comfortable in. But you only holiday there. Yes, but it has a... He waves his hands, grappling for words. Some kind of a feel about it that I find relaxing, soothing, even though I'm working while I'm there. That's why I bought it. Of course you did. Want it, get it. All right, I smile. I'll investigate every nook and cranny with a view to finding you something similar. An interesting turn of phrase. He gives me an appraising look, his eyes hooded. Perhaps if I find myself in the kitchen. I trail off, giving him a seductive smile. Like I said, I'm more interested in bedrooms at the moment. But woman, if you keep looking at me that way, we won't make it that far. I catch my breath, but I'm spared from answering, or from lunging across at him and sinking my fangs into his deliciously pulsating neck while straddling another pulsating part of him as the captain announces we're landing. Chapter 14 She's exactly how I imagine her mother must be. Tall, leggy, tanned, blonde, and a total cunt. So. This is the latest one, is it? She sneers at her father and jerks her head at me. Valerie, that's enough. He shakes his head at her, moving to kiss her on the cheek. I see the pain in his eyes as she dodges his kiss, snorts and brushes past us both, vaulting straight up the stairs of the jet. He turns to me, shaking his head. She's a great kid. When you get to know her. I'll bet. What I'm wondering, though, as he says this, is what she means by the latest. Latest what? Woman? Just how often does he bring lovers with him on holiday? I'm spared from sarcastically asking him just this by the harried look on his face. I'll be back shortly. He runs his hand through his hair, turning to make his way to the limousine where, presumably, his ex-wife is waiting behind the dark glass windows to be equally as horrible to him as his daughter had been. I nod and make my way back up the jet stairs. It's early morning and a little too bright for my tastes, even though we're parked inside a hangar, shielded from the direct sunlight. Entering the plane, I flop back into my tan leather seat and cock my head at the girl where she sits in her father's seat, sneering at me. I clench my teeth and study her. She's wearing tight, pale blue designer jeans with little spangly decorations around the cuffs, a mid-drift revealing white knit jumper, and little white beret pinned to the top of her head with a pink spangly clip. Isn't one enough? One? Don't talk to me. She curls her lip, putting her phone up close to her face and dialing before lowering it and staring at me once more. Ugh, do you mind? She points to the phone where I can hear a faint voice saying, Hello? Val, is that you? No, I smirk. I lean further back in my seat and stare at her. Oh, for God's sake! She rolls her eyes, flouncing out of her seat and slamming the bedroom sliding door shut with a bang. There go my mile-high plans. I narrow my eyes and take another drink. I might be able to withstand killing her father. But this kid... Well, let's just say she's on borrowed time if this shit keeps up. I lean my head back and close my eyes but her teenage angst and rambling in the room next door eventually draws my attention, and I listen in to her phone conversation. I'm sure he'll be there. This year with me all grown and my new nose, he can't not notice me. No, Darren's too dreamy for that. I just want to show him I'm a woman. I mean, last year he, you know. Yeah, so for sure this year. I smirk, so Daddy's little girl was definitely not so little. I wonder who this Darren is and what he did last year, but decide actually, no, I don't wonder. Young love was sickening enough, but with a monstrously spoiled little brat like this one, it could only be even more so. A nose job at 15? 
What kind of a mother allows that? I close my eyes, shutting out the rest of her vacuous conversation and trying to catch up on much-needed sleep. The day is my bedtime, and the nights are my work. But everything is all messed up now that I'm going to Aspen. I just hope my luck holds in terms of dark-windowed limousines and dim interiors. My experience of chalets in the snow regions is that they're generally warm, cozy, timber-paneled, and heavily curtained. But I know they can also be freezing, isolated prisons, full of individuals with penchants for inhuman cruelty. Turning my thoughts to more pleasant paths, I drift into sleep, waking only when I feel the jet begin to hum beneath me, and I realize we're taking off again. I look across to where Christopher sits working on a laptop. His brows are furrowed in concentration. Hello, sleeping beauty. I smile. Where's your daughter? She's resting in the bedroom. He shuts his computer and looks at me. We should land in about four hours. If you want to continue sleeping, that's fine with me. Are you saying you want me to shut up so you can work? Not at all. He grins. I prefer your conversation. I snort. I bet you don't play poker very well either. He chuckles. On the contrary, I play very well. As do I. Then perhaps we're simply able to gauge better than most what the other is thinking. Or feeling. Although he sure as hell wouldn't want to know what's going on inside my head right now. Was my daughter rude to you when you entered the plane? She's just a kid, I shrug. Did you know she had a nose job? I hope my question doesn't reveal what I'm really wondering, if his parenting skills are equally as lacking as his ex-wife's. Is that what she told you? He chuckles. No, I just overheard her say she had a new nose. She broke hers after a bad riding accident show jumping when she was eight. It never quite looked the same after, but the specialist wouldn't operate until she was at least 14 to remediate the slight curve. Something to do with bone density and growth rates. She had it fixed properly last year, and she's just had her braces removed. I hardly recognized her when I saw her this morning. How long has it been since you've seen her? Nine months. His expression turns dark. She's been kept from me for nine months. I realize now that many of the phone conversations he'd had after hours that I'd listened in on must have been with his wife, arguing over access to his daughter. I see. I lean down, pick up a chilled bottle of mineral water, and take a sip, deciding it might be best to change the subject. So, how many guests exactly are you planning on having in your Aspen Lodge? Usually between 150 to 200. He sees the surprise on my face and smirks. Like I said, it's business and pleasure. More business by the sounds of it. I shake my head. Not with you here. I meet his gaze steadily and slowly recross my legs. I guess I better get my rest now then before we get settled into our room. Yes? He shifts in his seat. I smirk and see his lips quirk into that sexy smile I like so much. Ms. Danube, I could be forgiven for thinking with a smirk like that that you enjoy making me uncomfortable. I could say the same to you. I take another sip of my water and run my tongue over my bottom lip as I hold his gaze. He quirks his eyebrow and places his laptop carefully to the side, and I hold my breath, waiting for him to make a move. But just then, the bedroom door slides open, and Princess Bitchface stalks out. Daddy, I don't like it that you have one of your whores on the plane with us, and neither does Mommy. She said she'll have words with you. I'm not speaking to you until you send that woman. She points to me. To the crew's cabin. I snort. Daddy and Mommy? Just how old is Veruca Salt? Five? Speaking to anyone might be difficult for you without a tongue. I look up at her. I expect an apology right about now. Did you hear that, Daddy? She turns to her father, her expression incredulous. Apologize to my real estate agent right now, Valerie. I won't. Christopher picks up the handset near his seat. Pilot, turn the plane around. My daughter's returning home. The plane begins to turn. What? No! Daddy! She throws her hands up in the air. Do you have something you wish to say to my business associate? Sorry. Pardon? I raise an eyebrow. I said, sorry. Christopher looks at me questioningly, 
and I nod. He picks up the handset again. Pilot, ignore that. Continue to Aspen. The plane turns and Valerie throws me a contemptuous look before stomping back to the bedroom and slamming the door behind her. I apologize for my daughter. It takes a while after she leaves her mother's influence for her to remember her manners. You were right to ask her to speak in a more respectful tone. I know, I smile. I was a teenager once. She's just a little girl. I shake my head but say nothing. His love for his daughter and blindness to her faults is, if anything, even more attractive than his money. Keep working. I nod to his computer and watch as he picks it up and opens it again. I think I'll rest until we land, if you don't mind. I shut my eyes, but blocking out one set of senses only heightens another. My sense of smell. The aroma of his blood and his body set my fangs on edge, and I force my eyes open after a few minutes and pick up my phone to check my messages. There's several from former clients and business associates wishing me a Merry Christmas, and some from the girls. The last one, though, a voice message from Charlotte, makes me shake my head as I pinch my nose between my thumb and forefinger and suppress a groan. Serena, don't bite the billionaire. Chapter 15 I sit on the edge of the massive bed and bite my lip. I feel like a virgin on her wedding night. But it's not me that needs to be careful about spilling blood on the crisp white sheets. It's the man on his way up in the lift right now. I look around the room and shake my head in wonder. The luxury is out of this world. Just outside, a private jacuzzi on the balcony overlooks the forest and ski fields beyond. Inside, a huge spa bath sits up against the windows. Together they ensure views from the water, no matter the weather. Bathing aside, a sunken lounge with deep black, squishy leather couches fronts a roaring log fire. A bar with every drink anyone could ever want sits against one wall. Discreet doors open into ensuites and dressing rooms, and the bed is triple king. I never want to leave this room. Except, I'll have to, because I'll need to feed before the week is out. I feel my thirst rise at the thought of Christopher's blood, and once again concentrate away that need, focusing on another, purely animal need. The need for his body on mine. It's been months now. Weeks together. Weeks apart. And all that time I've felt his presence in the back of my mind, remembered his smell, dreamt of what it would have been like if I'd let him take me that night on the kitchen bench. Now's the time to stop dreaming and start living. If you can call existence as a vampire, living. Yet I feel more alive than I have in centuries. Can it be this man? And if so, how can I avoid killing him? Just control. It'll take control. I whisper to myself, my eyes lingering on the jacuzzi. It's evening now the stars just visible in the sky, and a light snowfall has just begun. Tess would say it was magical if she could see the winter wonderland spread out before me. I decide, on the spur of the moment, to get naked and sit in the hot, bubbly water on the balcony. If I can diffuse his scent, I might be able to resist his blood and concentrate on his body. Being outside and in water might be just the trick. Grinning at my ingenuity, I divest myself of my little red dress and matching red panties and bra, leaving them strewn on the white bed linen, and head out onto the balcony. As I walk, I pile my hair up high on top of my head, twisting it into a loose bun. Stepping outside, I find the air bracing, my skin goose-bumping immediately. Walking quickly across the snow-covered balcony tiles, I reach the timber edge of the jacuzzi and slip carefully over the side immersing myself in the bubbling, scented water. I feel instantly more relaxed, every knotted and tense muscle melting as I sigh in pleasure. Leaning my head back in pure bliss, I close my eyes and listen to the sound of revelry surrounding me. I can hear strains of Christmas music, laughter, voices from across the snowfields from people just coming in after a day on the slopes, glasses tinkling. Even if this all goes to shit now, right now, I'm happy. Just as I think this, my exceptional hearing picks up footsteps on the long, carpeted hallway heading towards our room. A key turns in the lock of the suite's door. Looking through the windows into the room, from where I sit hidden in bubbles, 
I see the two bellboys who'd carried my bags up enter carrying another set of luggage. Ah, uh, I don't think you have the right room, I call out laughing. Unless Mr. Barrington favors pink luggage. Which, let's be fair, I thought he might. Up to a few months ago. I'm spared from trying to sort out the mess as Christopher enters the room, frowns at the luggage, and tells them another room number. Once they've left, lugging the armloads of bags, he shuts the door carefully behind them and scans the room. His eyebrow quirk when he sees the bed strewn with my underwear, and his lips follow suit when he sees where I am. He pauses to take off his jacket and loosen his tie. My breath catches as he unbuttons his shirt, shrugging it off his wide shoulders. Are you ready, Miss Danube? As I'll ever be, I smile, my stomach tightening as he undoes his belt and begins to unzip his pants. Good. He walks towards the double glass doors leading onto the balcony in all his naked glory. I've organized a complete lodge tour for you. I see his lips twitch. The chief housekeeper's waiting for you in the foyer. Is that so? I rise from the jacuzzi standing naked before him. He stops, mid-stride, and I hear his sharp intake of breath and see him swallow hard. She's going to be waiting a while. Oh, you got that right. I smirk. Chapter 16 I stretch and smile as I open my eyes before widening them in horror and launching myself from the sheets. Sprinting across to the window, I draw the massive curtains across to cover the dawn. Dull sunlight had just begun to streak in and light up the room. Gasping at the close call, I stumble back to the bed, frowning as I crawl across to his side, and realize it's cold. We'd spent another night, our fourth, fucking all over the room. Outside, inside, floor, desk, bathroom tiles, bar. And I must have fallen into an exhausted stupor, forgetting all about drawing the curtains. It was around 3.30 a.m. before we'd collapsed onto the bed. Where could he be now? Reaching over to the side table, I flip over my phone and see the time is 6.30 a.m. There's a message from Christopher waiting for me. Merry Christmas, Sleeping Beauty. I've got business meetings all day today and into evening. I'd tell you not to wait up for me again, but if last night was anything to go by, I hope you will. Chris. I smile and quickly respond. I'll be waiting, with bells on, and nothing else. That ought to give him something to think about. Rolling over, I plump up my pillow and prepare to go back to sleep. So far, this trip has been a monumental success. I've spent my evenings having the best sex of my life, and my daytime touring the lodge, top to bottom as I'd promised. I'd also been busy researching properties for my billionaire, in between catching up on sleep. And I hadn't bitten him. That wasn't to say there hadn't been some close calls. My fangs have a will of their own, and my libido is closely linked. Or it had been in the past, with my bloodlust. But so far, I'd managed to maneuver myself so he didn't see my teeth. And if I absolutely had to, I'd sunk my fangs into other things. Furniture, bed linen, the timber side of the jacuzzi, anything but his jugular. It was starting to get easier and easier to control myself. I'm sure the girls would be proud. The only fly in the ointment is that day by day, and night by night I'm growing more attached to this man. I don't know how I'm going to leave him when this is all over, because leave him I must. A vampire cannot have a relationship with a human, especially not this vampire. My friends and I have enemies, enemies we've evaded for centuries, true. But the danger is still very real. I can't put Christopher in harm's way. The only way to really keep him safe is to avoid being around him. I need to end this the moment we return home and his new house is purchased. End this and leave town. Finally, frustrated and angry at the turn of my thoughts, I give up on sleep and rise to peep out the window. The sunlight's not deadly today. Yet again, it's an overcast, gray, and snowy day. As good a day as any to hunt. And I need to feed if I'm going to keep my billionaire safe. This is the one thing amidst all the uncertainty I have about my feelings for him that I know for sure. If I'm full of blood, I'm more able to control my urges. Turning to my suitcase, I draw out the gloves and beanie Charlotte had knitted for me and hold them momentarily to my face, feeling the soft touch of the cashmere. Trust Charlotte to use the finest and softest fabric in the world.
it feels wonderful. I slip on the beanie and my jeans and laugh when I see the jumper Tess bought for me for Christmas. It's a green elf with fangs on a white background. I don it quickly before holding up the small box Prue had slipped into my bag. It's Christmas Day, and I'm without my friends, my family, for the first time in several centuries. Opening the box, I find a long, delicate golden chain featuring a four-leaf clover pressed inside a tiny crystal heart. Carved on the back and teeny tiny writing are all our names. I turn to face the window as I put the chain around my neck, staring out unseeing at the white view. That's me, though, isn't it? I think ruefully. A heart of glass containing just a smidgen of luck, and my friends. Only lately, whenever I see Christopher, my heart feels like it isn't made of glass at all. It feels flesh and blood, but just as breakable. I turn from my moody contemplation of the view, gloves now on, as I hear movement at our door. That was a quick business meeting. Smiling, I wait for his familiar face and think it might not be a bad thing, after all, to take him in front of the fire before I hunt, when I see a woman enter the room. Who are you? A tall brunette asks as she tips the bellboy and flicks the door shut behind her with one long black heel. I walk towards her, shaking my head. I might ask you the same question, why did the staff let you into my room? Yours? She laughs. This is Christopher Barrington's master suite. I'm aware of that. I'm staying here as a guest of his. A guest? She looks me up and down, from my jeans and socks to my elf jumper, beanie, and matching gloves, and sneers. You mean he's screwing you? You? She waves her hand up and down to indicate I couldn't possibly be anything anyone would want to nail. And that's your business because, I ask, my voice deadly. She narrows her eyes. That bastard! That fucking bastard! I'm sorry, I shake my head. I don't understand. Of course you don't, she snorts. He likes it that way. Who? The man with the money, she sneers. Just who are you? I frown, beginning to feel pissed off, which is, frankly, never a good thing when I'm feeling hungry. My name's Dominique. I'm Christopher's partner. As in business partner? No, bed partner. Her life is spared as the door opens once more, and the man in question strides in. Dominique, what are you doing here? How long did you think you could keep this secret? She demands. You fuck me every evening and keep another woman on the next floor. What? I feel my fingers curl, and I know I need to leave the room shortly if I'm to avoid a killing spree. My fangs begin to descend, try as I might to hold them back. I quickly put my hand to my mouth to hide them, a move that might come across as me looking shocked to a casual observer. Dominique, I don't know what you're playing at. I told you not to come here. Christopher slips his hands into his pockets, affecting a nonchalant stance. You didn't tell me you were taking another mistress, that you were discarding me, she spits. Mistress? I turn my eyes to him, my fangs now under control. Christopher? Serena, you might need to go for a walk or something. I'll sort this out and meet you for lunch. Yes, Serena, Dominique hisses. Go for a walk. Is this woman your mistress? I frown at him, not moving lest my anger gets the better of me and I rip either one or both of their heads off. Yes, but... I don't give him a chance to explain. I've never been very good at controlling my violent tendencies, particularly when I'm thirsty. And him, right now, saying that one word, feels like he's dropped a match into a tinder-dry forest. Taking two quick steps, I pop him a hard right on the jaw, not hard enough to break it, but hard enough to watch with satisfaction as he flies across the room and lands with a thud on the bed, a good seven or so meters away. He stands up, shaking his head to clear it and rubbing his jaw, eyes incredulous as they meet mine. Fuck. Evenings, apparently, I hiss. No. He shakes his head again, moving his jaw from side to side, testing to see if it's broken. Oh, yes. Dominique laughs. I spin to her and slap her hard enough to knock her across the room and into the door. She lands with a substantial crash and I follow her swiftly, my mood murderous, 
intent on snapping her in two. Serena, stop. Christopher strides towards me and grabs my hands, holding them firmly down to my sides as he looks me in the eye. She's lying. What's she doing here? He's lying. He told me to come, you psychopath. Dominique screeches, her face puce as she rises to her knees and scrambles to open the door. Is that true? I ask, my eyes never leaving my lover's. It was before. He frowns, releasing my hands and turning away. Before what? Ages ago, before I knew you'd come with me. So what? I take a deep breath, trying to control my rage. You have a backup woman to warm your bed here every winter? No, don't be ridiculous. He shakes his head as he sees Dominique practically fall out the door and stumble, crying down the hallway. Christopher, I put my hands on my hips. You have about five minutes to explain yourself before I knock your fucking block off. His laughter booms out across the room, surprising me and ratcheting up my anger a hundredfold. Woman. He shakes his head, smirking, clearly underestimating the danger he's in. You are fucking amazing. I'll tell you everything. Just don't hit me again. I let out a deep breath, slowly letting go of my ire as he takes my hand and leads me to the leather couch in front of the fire. Look, I've lived the life of a single man for a long, long time. And yes, Dominique is my mistress, was my mistress. Consider her gone. Oh, she's gone all right, I think to myself, just not in the way he's imagining. I'm gathering, I murmur as I look away from him and towards the fire, that she's not the first. No, there have been a string of them, starting the year after I married. Hence your ex-wife still being angry with you and wanting to punish you. Your words, I mutter. Yes. He sighs. But she's punishing me for more than that. I never loved her, and I told her so. She's made it her life's work to hurt me as much as she can for that. Why the fuck would you marry someone and tell them you didn't love them? I turned to him, searching his face for answers. College. I got her pregnant when we were in college. I wanted her to terminate, but her family are Catholic, and her father was a business associate of my father's. It was agreed I'd do the right thing. But the right thing for her was never the right thing for me. The only saving grace was the moment I set eyes on my little girl, and that was the moment my wife knew she had a weapon she could use to punish me for the rest of my days. Ah, so that's why your daughter asked why you needed more than one. She knows about the mistress. My ex-wife has been very sure to poison my daughter against me and paint me as the bastard for a long time. I'm sorry. I put my hand under his chin, noting him wince and kiss him gently on the lips. I had no idea. Dominique was invited earlier this year, well before I met you, but I haven't seen her since before I started house hunting. I'd forgotten all about her being here until I saw her pink luggage delivered the day we arrived. Have you... I swallow hard. Have you been spending evenings with her and nights with me? God, no. Do you think I'm Superman? Pardon? Serena, I haven't been fucked so hard and so thoroughly for a very long time. Either I'm starting to show my age, or you're one hell of a vixen in the sack. Jesus. I'm hard-pressed to even concentrate in my meetings. All I can think about is getting back to this room and tearing your clothes off. I smile a wide, genuine smile. That's all I think about, too. Chapter 17 Christopher, I... Look, I have something to tell you. I turn to him where he lies beside me, slick with sweat from our makeup sex. I'm determined to let him know that things are going to end between us. Must end. I can't wait any longer, because I can see now that I might not be the only one who'll be hurt if we go on. Because we just made love. It was nothing like the animal sex of previous days. Things have changed, deepened. He shakes his head, interrupting what I'm about to say. Wait, hang on. I have something for you first. He rises and walks naked through to the bathroom, his rock-hard ass making me want him again, at least one more time, before I tell him what I need to. I've thought of all sorts of reasons I could use to explain why we can't be together. But he's a smart man, shrewd and intelligent. I know I really need to tell him the truth and allow him to run for the hills. 
it needs to be him who leaves. I don't think I'm strong enough. His confession about his mistresses, his honesty with me about everything I'd asked him about during our many nights cradled in each other's arms. Not to mention my devastation and jealousy when I thought he was sleeping with someone else. It can only mean one thing. I'm in love with this man and I don't want to leave him. I have to tell him what I am and let the chips fall where they may. But how? He returns and picks up his jacket from where it was discarded on the lounge, rummaging around in his pocket before triumphantly rising with a long, black, velvet case. This will perfectly match your eyes. I picked it up in Brazil while I was cruising with my brother. Even then, I couldn't stop thinking about you. I intended to give it to you this morning for Christmas, but you were fast asleep. That's why I came back to the room. But then, Dominique... And the kissing and making up. I smirk. Yes. So Merry Christmas. You can wear it with the dress I bought for you to wear to the ball tonight. There's a ball? Wait, there's a dress? He smiles in indulgence at me as I peer at the case in his hands, and he flicks the little gold ornate catch open. My gasp fills the room. It's a collar of fingernail-sized emeralds and diamonds set in a platinum line of perfection. The clasp is in the shape of two diamond hands entwined. Chris, I whisper, I can't accept this. It must be worth millions. He smiles gently. If a man can't spend a little of his hard-earned on a woman he likes, what's the point? So, I smirk, you like me. His eyes darken. It's a look I know very well now, and my stomach tightens in anticipation. Christopher, I... How can I say it? Just come out and say, oh well... I think you should know I'm a vampire. Christ. He kneels on the bed and moves to put the necklace on me, his cool fingers lightly brushing my collarbone, his breath stirring the curls near my ear as I move my head slightly and meet his gaze. I can't resist chocolate eyes. They make me melt inside, my mouth water, which is just the problem. It had taken every bit of my willpower not to bite him while we had sex, given how hungry I am. And now, him standing here before me, naked, buff, strong. I feel my fangs descend against my will, and I turn from him, rise, and walk briskly to the bathroom. I want to run, but I maintain at least this much control as I quietly close the door behind me. Running a freezing shower, I stand under the hard cascade of tiny needles, my hands against the tiled wall, and will my fangs to hide. Control, control, control. Don't bite the billionaire. Control. I breathe my mantra over and over. Jesus, I have to hunt. I have to feed. He taps lightly on the door. Serena, I can choose something else if the gift isn't to your taste. I close my eyes for a second and screw my face up in agony. Taste? Well, that's the problem, isn't it? Everything about him appeals to my taste, literally. And how could I not like it? Is there any woman on earth who wouldn't? I shake my head. I love it. You'll wear it tonight? Yes, I reply, my words garbled by the water I'm allowing to flow into my mouth, which is fortunate because he walks in then and joins me. Ugh, a cold shower? You don't have to be in here, I mutter, my back to him lest my fangs descend once more. He places his hands on my hips and tilts me, so my ass is pressed against his hard, hard body. There's no place I'd rather be. Chapter 18 The sound of an orchestra echoes down the long corridor as I walk carefully in my new gold heels and smile at passers-by. I feel a little like Cinderella going to the ball, all dressed in finery supplied by someone else. But at least my shoes are not glass, and I don't have to worry about my chariot turning into a pumpkin. I'd taken so long to bathe and dress with a quick side trip ostensibly to have my hair done by the in-house hairdresser, but actually to eat Dominique and dump her body in the basement incinerator that Christopher had needed to leave earlier to greet guests. Entering the ballroom, I see it's crowded with well-dressed people holding champagne in tall flutes and chatting in small groups or pairs. Scanning the room for Christopher, I find him just as he looks up and meets my eyes, his own shining with promise. God, he's hot. He's speaking to a tall man who has his back to me, and I begin to cross the room towards them, 
when my feet slow of their own accord. The cut of the man's jacket, the hold of the man's shoulders, and the way he stands all send a shiver of dread down my back. It couldn't be, could it? As if on cue, Christopher says something, and the tall man he's speaking to turns. I stop mid-stride and gasp as I meet his eyes across the crowded room. He's just as I remember, pale, deathly pale, and deathly thin. Evil personified. Solomon. Sir Ina. His word is audible only to my ears, and a sly grin spreads across his face. My eyes flash briefly in terror to Christopher's before I spin and run from the room. And I do mean run. To human eyes, I might just look like a blur. Pulling my phone out of my tiny green spangled bag as I sprint along the long carpeted hallway towards the lift, I dial Tess, the only one I know who'll reliably answer her phone. Hello? Having fun? No. Tess, tell everyone to pack. Pack now and leave for the cabin. When I get there, we'll figure out our next move. I enter the lift and press the button to go down to the service levels as I bend down to take off my heels, throwing them and my bag into the corner. Serena? It's Solomon. Oh, God. I imagine she's dropped the phone in fright. I hear nothing as the lift dings open and I walk into the massive kitchen. Confused stares meet me, me in my evening dress, them in their black and white uniforms. But I ignore the staff and make my way to the back door delivery entrance. Tess? I'm still here. Do it now, Tess. Phone the others, wherever they are. If you can't reach them, go to their offices. Just get them packed and get them moving. What about you? He'll kill you. I'm leaving as we speak. I'm not even packing. I'm literally... I gasp as the blast of cold air hits me. Running into the woods, I'll head inland until I hit a township, and I'll catch a lift to the nearest airport from there. Run fast. Don't stop for anything. I won't. Now do what I told you. I hang up, shove my phone into the top of my bra, and begin to run as though my life depends upon it. Because it does. As I run, my brain goes over the last time I'd seen him. The last conversation I'd had with him. All those centuries ago, as he was tightening his grip on my throat and squeezing the life out of me. Serena, you need to accept what you are, what we are, and what you mean to me. I'm nothing to you, I choked. Exactly. Just let me go. I want no part of this anymore, I'd whispered, as I pointed to the young girl's bodies crisscrossed in heaps on his castle floor. They all looked the same, their eyes wide with shock. Mouths open, screaming even in death. You may run, run as far and as fast as you like, you and your little cabal. You know how I enjoy a hunt. You're letting us go? I'd squeaked, as he released his grip on my neck. My dear Serena, 100 years I've known you and you've known me. Have you ever heard of me letting someone go? No. When I catch you, and I will catch you, You'll wish for the easy death my food receives. I turned then and run out the door, just as I had now, collecting my friends as I ran, knowing that he might change his mind at any second, knowing he might not give us the head start that he'd intimated he would, that he was simply toying with me as he always had before reaching out and killing us all. And death? Yes, death would be welcome if he found us because his food never went quietly into the still night. They were always tortured for days, slashed, burned, cut, pulled, pushed, pinced, and impaled. Anything and everything a nightmare could suggest. That was Solomon. And that was 300 years, and many, many countries ago. I shake my head now as I run, the cold causing my nose to run, the ends of my hair to icicle, and my bare toes to lose feeling. If I can get home, get to the cabin before his minions reach the city and begin their search for us, as even now I know he'll be organizing, we might, just might, once again, evade him. Dodging trees and flitting across the forest floor, I occasionally fall as, here and there, I bog down in knee-deep drifts. But as the snowfall thickens, it's allowing me a moment of hope that my footprints will soon be covered, my trail growing cold. 
I speed up. I know that if it takes him a minute or two to question Christopher about where I'm staying, where I live, and what relationship I have with him, then those valuable minutes could just save my life. Also, it's been a long time since he had any inkling as to my thoughts. He might not anticipate me leaving on foot. He might think I would try to take a car, or that I might wait and beg Christopher to help me. He was wrong on both fronts, and this, this could give me enough time to get away. My thoughts are positive, terrified but positive as I run, but my momentum stalled as I near the edge of the lodge's grounds and hear a scream. Frowning in case pursuit is closer than I think, I stop momentarily to listen. Crying and laughing. Sinister laughing. I'm torn between shrugging and continuing or pausing to investigate when I hear the scream again and realize the reason it stopped me in my tracks. It's Valerie. Spinning to the right, I run to where I heard the cry and after a few minutes come across vehicle tracks. Not long after, I follow the sound of begging and crying and find Christopher's little girl on her back in the snow, a young man on top of her doing his best to pull off her ski pants. Racing over to the pair, I grab the back of his jacket and haul him off the girl, throwing him 20 meters or more towards the nearest tree. I note with satisfaction when he slams into a spruce, only to widen my eyes in shock as he suddenly puffs into black dust and disintegrates before my eyes. Oh, fucking hell, he was with Solomon. Staring at the tree, I realize I'd thrown the young-looking vampire with such force he'd been impaled on one of the sharp, dead lower branches sticking out from the trunk. Somehow, against all the odds, it had pierced his heart. Stalking over to the tree, I bend down and pick up his wallet, mostly incinerated. The credit cards are twisted and ruined, but there's cash in a gold clip. A little crisp around the edges, but okay. I shove the money clip into my bra near my phone and stalk back to Valerie where she still lies on the ground on her back. Blinded by tears, she's concentrating hard as she shakily tries to zip up her torn jacket. She hadn't noticed her bow disappear into a cloud of dust. Reaching down, I haul her up with one hand and pull her close to me, smoothing down her hair and pushing it out of her face so I can look her in the eye. This was Darren? Yes. Did you sneak out to meet with him? She nods and leans into my chest, her shoulders shuddering as she gulps, and I reluctantly put my arms around her. I gather he wasn't such a gentleman when you were alone. She shakes her head, still crying. You need to get back to the lodge, back to your father. Oh God, you won't tell Daddy, will you? Will you? Please don't tell him. I won't tell him anything. My eyes stray to the tree where new snow is already covering the small smattering of black dust that is all that remains of Darren. Can you find your way back? I don't think so. We came on his snowmobile. She points to a vehicle parked unobtrusively in the tree line. Where's Darren? Will he come after me? She shudders, worriedly scanning the trees. He's run away. I shrug. He won't be back. Can't you take the vehicle? Follow the tracks the way you came? Even as I say this, I realize there are no tracks to follow. The snow has swallowed them already. Fuck! She sniffs a half laugh at my cursing, and I shake my head at my own idiocy. But she's all Christopher has now. She's all he cares about. I have to make sure she returns safely. I have to believe Solomon didn't know what his minion was up to. I don't think he'd allow a kid in his inner circle of rich prick friends to be murdered. He hadn't become a powerful billionaire by casually slaughtering his business associates. Darren should be grateful. I definitely saved him a long and horrible death at the hands of his master if he'd hurt or killed Valerie. Listen, Valerie. Listen very carefully to me. I'm going to take you back. I'm going to dump you at the back door at the staff entrance, and you can sneak back up to your room from there, okay? She nods as I push her away and hold her at arm's length, looking her in the eye. But then I have to leave. Something has come up, something important. I can see she's relieved. Even if I'd stayed, I sigh. I wouldn't have told your father. Why not? We're not friends. She frowns as I spin her, none too gently, and frog march her towards the snow ski. Because I care about him. And believe it or not, I was young once. As I say this, I hop onto the snow ski, indicating to her to sit behind me, 
and I almost laugh. Once is a very loaded word, and if I don't dump her and get the hell away from that lodge, I'm not going to get any older. I hope she has a strong stomach because warp speed is an understatement for how fast I'm driving. Valerie, I shout into the wind and snow, you can't tell anyone you've seen me or Darren, no matter who asks you, especially Darren's boss, Solomon. You need to stick to saying you never saw either of us. Don't even let anyone know you were with Darren, ever. Do you understand? I'll keep your secret. You keep mine. Agreed? Agreed. Great, and Valerie? Yeah? Stop being such a little cunt to your father. He loves you. It wouldn't kill you to listen to him now and again. If you had, you mightn't have found yourself almost raped and murdered in a snowy forest in the middle of fucking nowhere. I know. Only my excellent vampire hearing allows me to catch her whispered reply, but I nod, and we continue the rest of the trip in silence. Chapter 19 The airport. I snap to the taxi driver as I jump into the back seat. I'd driven the snowmobile until the fuel ran out and run the rest of the way towards the town. But I know, given the blizzard, I can't run any further. Especially since I know I'm being pursued. Dropping Valerie off had been necessary, but it had gone against my every instinct and had put me at a distinct disadvantage. Bad night to be out and about, the taxi driver remarks as he pulls out into the snowy road and begins the drive. Specially dressed like that, he leers at me. I know he's right. Dressed as I am in my tight green gown, strapless and soaked from snowfall, wearing no shoes, my hair a must tangle, I look as though I've seen better days. I look like an out-of-luck hooker. I look like a potential victim. And I know that if there is one thing that will guarantee you become a victim, it's already appearing to be one. I see his tattooed hands tighten on the steering wheel, his piggish eyes on me in the rear vision mirror as much as on the road ahead. You're right. I chew my lip, ignoring his predatory stare for the time being as my brain furiously tries to figure out how the hell I'm going to get out of this mess. Solomon will know I want to get away as quickly as possible. He'd for sure look at the airport first. I've changed my mind, I murmur. Can you turn around, please? I think I'll stay in this town another night, after all. He smiles and pulls to the side of the road. Have you got somewhere to stay, pretty lady? He turns to lean over the back seat and look at me as he makes to do a three-point turn. Sure, I shrug, before launching forward and digging my fangs into his neck. He bawls and tries to bat me away. But even with his brawny strength, he's no match for me. In three long, deep gulps, he's mostly dead. I finish him off and lurch out into the driving snow and sleet. It stings my face, but I reach down and take a handful of snow to wash the blood from my lips, before dragging the driver's body to the side of the road and rolling it down the slope of the drainage channel. Hopping into the driver's seat, I ensure the engaged light is on and spin the taxi back to face the way I want to go. Out of town. Hell fast. Chapter 20 Where the fuck is Tess? I scan the small cabin as soon as I walk into the room. I'm beat, frumpy, scared as hell, and equally as mad that I had to leave a ballroom and drive halfway across the country, ditching stolen cars left, right, and center, only to find my instructions hadn't been carried out. My friends are not all present and accounted for. She went back for Scruffy. No. We couldn't stop her. We collected Boeing, but Scruffy was nowhere to be found. You know how she feels about those cats. When did she leave? We managed to keep her here for two days. We thought we'd convinced her that our way was the best way, but she lulled us into a false sense of security and went back, about three or four hours ago. Prue stares into the small, crackling fire, shoulders hunched. That's where we think she's gone anyway. He'll be there, I whisper, my face pale, voice shaking. You know how fast he moves. Neither of us could convince her to stay, and we both offered to go in her stead. You know how she is. I grit my teeth and peel my dirty clothes off as I make my way to the bathroom. Of all the people to go missing, it had to be Tess. Tess, the quiet, sweet, vacant dumbass who couldn't fight her way out of a wet paper bag. 
Tess whom we all protected and loved to bits, and for a cat. I'm going to get changed and go find her, I shout from the small shower stall. Charlotte, you need to dump my stolen SUV into the lake or drive it over a cliff or something. It can't be here. You stole a car? Are you crazy? I had to get out of there fast with nothing but the clothes on my back. I dry my hair as I walk back into the room and meet Prue's disapproving look. I had no money for a flight. The little bit of cash I had I used to hole up in cheap motels during the day. And I was starving when I met the owner of the vehicle. Win-win. And you're definitely sure he saw you? I know who she means without asking. He said my name. Fuck. Fuckity. Fuck. Exactly. I shiver as I sit on the couch and pull on fresh ski pants before donning a black skivvy and walking to the door where our old camping jackets hang neatly on pegs. And there's worse. I, ah, uh, might have killed one of his companions. Oh my fucking god. I had no choice. I'll fill you in on the gory details as soon as I get back. You two dump the car and get everything that isn't nailed down packed. We have to decide where we're going from here. I have an idea. A city in mind where we can start again. But it's a long drive. We need to move fast. Why can't we just stay here? Charlotte screws up her nose. We could wait until the dust settles and start again. He would never expect that. Weren't you listening? Prue rolls her eyes. She killed one of his. Nothing will stop him from finding us this time. Don't panic, Prue. I put my hand on her shoulder as she buries her face in her hands. We've done it before. We'll do it again. We just have to keep our heads. And Charlotte, to answer your question, even this cabin in the mountains isn't safe enough. If there's a way to track us, he will. And this little place is in my name. Your old name. How long do you think it will take him to trace my current surname to any of the ones I've held in past decades? I shake my head. He's hobnobbing it with billionaires. These people have no boundaries and no rules. Remember laws catch the little guys, not the big guys. Like spider webs. Prue nods, grimacing. She's collected herself now and back to the Prue I know. Yeah, we have to leave, Char. Start again. Serena, I'm the best fighter. I'll go and find Tess. Just tell me the name of the city you have in mind. I'll catch up with you two. No. Charlotte shakes her head. We shouldn't separate. We should get Tess and all leave together. Agreed, I nod. And Prue, you're good. I snort. But I think faster on my feet. I'm deadly calm at the moment, and I won't hesitate to kill anyone in my path. Can you say the same? She shakes her head. I'll be back before dawn, with Tess. Chapter 21 I catch my breath as I stare at the mess that was once our apartment block. The street lights shed otherworldly shadows on the gutted building, making a once warm and safe home feel macabre. All that remains are blackened holes where windows have exploded from the fire that obviously ripped through the entire complex a day or so ago. Literally a few hours, I estimate, from the time Solomon saw me. The snow does nothing to dampen the smell of burnt electrical equipment, plastics, and fabrics. Orange danger, do not enter tape, is crisscrossed over the boundary separating the apartments from the sidewalk and street. Drive on, I say to the taxi driver, around the block, slowly, if you wouldn't mind. He nods and begins the curb crawl around the block. As we come to the third corner fronting the playground that our apartment windows once overlooked, I tell him to stop and wait. Sitting on the top of the slide that curves down from the replica pirate ship is a black cat, scruffy. Only my excellent vampire vision could have picked him up, sitting so still, blending in with the night. I push open the door and run to the slide, my boots slipping for purchase against the wet plastic but the strength in my arms pulling me to the top. The cat turns to dash away, but I reach out and grab his tail, ignoring his yowl and pull him to my chest. If he's here, his owner can't be far. Tess? I shout low towards the little timber bow of the boat. It's enclosed with a roof and three sides for children to turn the big wheel in all weather, pretending they're sailing a ship. It's a good place to hide. Yeah, I'm here. I could almost shout for joy at hearing her voice. Tess may not be able to fight, but there was one thing she was very good at. She could hide like no one I'd ever encountered. 
Tess, what happened? I found Scruffy. I walk towards the wheelhouse and bending down low, see her crunched into a corner, her chin resting on her knees. Are you hurt? No. You're safe now. You can come out. I can't. I saw a man, a vampire. He's been circling the apartments every few minutes. I ducked in here before he could see me. I've been too scared to even grab Scruffy, and he won't come when I bloody call him. Scruffy's a little prick, I frown. But I've got him. See? I hold up the cat, giving his neck an extra squeeze when he digs his claws into my arm. How long have you been hiding here? A long time. When was the last time you saw the vampire? I don't know. I've been too scared to take another look. I sigh and straighten up, leaning out of the wheelhouse and narrowing my eyes as I scan the tree line. It doesn't take long to spot him. If I had to guess, I'd say Solomon had sent someone on the off chance we'd be stupid enough to come back. Generally, I'd say he wouldn't have had a hope in hell. Yet here we are. Here, I pass Tess the cat. Stay low, stay out of sight. But when I scream at you to run, you run to that taxi waiting outside the playground and get in. Do you understand me, Tess? Yes. And when you get in, you get him to drive you to the Russian mansion. You remember? The one that looked like a gingerbread house? Yes, I remember. It's still vacant. Climb the wall and hide on the grounds. I'll meet you there. Okay. And Tess. Yeah? If you don't move when I shout, I'll run back and snap your cat's neck. I fucking promise you this. Do you understand? Yes. I can hear she's beginning to cry, and I immediately feel contrite. But sometimes only fear can overcome fear. If she's afraid for her cat, she'll do as I say. Although I'd never actually hurt the hideous thing. By the way, I quip to her as I make my way out of the wheelhouse towards where the vampire's hiding. I loved my elf jumper. I don't hear her response as I zip across to the trees to confront Solomon's minion. But I do hear the taxi door slam and the car move off when I shout at her to run. Taking advantage of the element of surprise, I grapple with the vampire, repeatedly slamming his head into a tree trunk. He's strong, very strong, but I'm faster, and I have desperation on my side. Breaking free from him, I make for the center of the park at a run, the center that I know features a small fountain for children to play in. It's complete with a little multi-level seat in the middle for mothers to sit on while watching their littlies, out of the direct line of the fountain spray. And this seat, I also know, features a multitude of little timber rungs, any one of which would make a very fine stake. Chapter 22 Christopher, I speak quickly into the phone, unsure of how much to tell him or what I should say. I want to tell him everything all at once. I've been longing to hear his voice. I'm sorry it's taken me so long to call. I'm sure you were worried sick. I owe you an explanation. No explanation needed. My mind spins. No explanation? I've been out of his life for a month, closed my business, moved to another city, and he doesn't want to know why? I frown. I mean, Christopher, I want to explain why I left the lodge and skipped town. You must have thought I was bonkers. No. No? My business associate was kind enough to fill me in. I stare at the phone, my eyes wide. You mean Solomon? Yes. Now, if you don't mind, Miss Danube, I'm a busy man. I know Solomon would never reveal the existence of our kind, so he must have said something else to make my billionaire act so cold. But what? Christopher, I scowl. I know it was terrible of me not to contact you sooner, but it was an emergency. If you'll let me explain. I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't have any more time to lend to this discussion. But what we had. I'm sure you'll understand when I say I no longer require your services. I don't understand. Ms. Danube, I'm a wealthy man, not unattractive or so I'm told, and most definitely not unintelligent. I come across many, many women on a day-to-day -day basis, keen to share my bed. I remain quiet. I have no idea where this is heading. Is this about the mistress again? Consequently. 
He carries on as if I hadn't spoken. I do not need to pay for my pleasures, other than in the usual ways, of course, as women are wont. And up to this time, they've been quite honest about what they've wanted from me, and I from them. I feel my blood freeze. I know what he's going to say now, but I need to hear the words. Christopher, what are you saying? I'm saying, Miss Danube, that my business partner informs me you are a whore, have been a whore for many, many years, and that there probably wasn't a man in the lodge who hadn't sampled your wares. I gasp. That's a lie. Are you telling me you're not a whore? I raise my head to the ceiling, circle my neck, close my eyes for a moment. If I could reach out now and destroy Solomon with mind power, I would. No. You are a whore? I hear the pain in his voice, even though he's trying to hide it. I was, I whisper, a long, long time ago. Three hundred years, give or take, I silently add. Then our conversation is concluded. His tone is laden with finality. I forgave you for having mistresses while you were married. I try to ignore the tears as they begin rolling down my cheeks. I didn't stand on some high moral ground with you. And for good reason, apparently. Don't you at least want to hear what I have to say? I'd tell him everything if he'd just listen. Like how I was forced to prostitute myself in childhood by my mother. Turned by a vampire in adulthood, only to be again forced to sell my body for a century for my captor's financial advantage. And later, subjected myself to the hands of strangers to keep my friends alive that I hated every moment of it, that I scrubbed and scrubbed and still, to this day, feel dirty when those memories resurface. But he doesn't give me the chance. I couldn't care less. You don't want to know me, because in the past I slept with men for money. I swallow the lump in my throat and dash my tears away on my sleeve. Is that truly what you're telling me? It is. Then goodbye, Mr. Barrington. I wish you good fortune, but if I could perhaps give you one piece of advice before we part company. I don't think so. He hangs up. I sigh and shake my head. It would be to sever all ties with Solomon. Chapter 23 My friends are beside themselves with worry. I don't often cry. I'm the strong one, but not today. Tess strokes my hair as I lie with my head on her lap, sobbing. If he couldn't accept your past as a prostitute, he would never have, could never have accepted you as a vampire. I know, I gulp, trying to pull myself together, for their sake. Not that you would have told him. Prue eyeballs me from where she sits in the armchair opposite, Charlotte facing her. No, I sniff. I don't let on that I was planning on doing exactly that. But Charlotte knows me too well. Yes, you would have because you're in love with him. You eventually, one way or the other, would have had to tell him. Then you would have had to turn him or kill him. It's maybe better this way, even though it hurts. At least you didn't hurt him. You don't have to carry that pain. Yes. I sit up and nod, meeting my friend's eyes. And we're all safe and together again. That's what really matters. And we don't have time to mourn the past. We have to start our businesses, our lives, all over again, because of that bastard Solomon. But Charlotte doesn't, I wipe my tears, because her clients are online. She doesn't need a physical address. And Prue, you said you were sick of the funeral and flower trade. You wanted to study landscape design. You should do it now. You have no excuse. And I'm okay? Tess shrugs. I can always find work in a funeral home, if not a morgue. Every town has one, and this city has several. Things could be worse. We just need to regroup. Do you think we're safe here? Tess looks at each one of us in turn. This is a big city, I nod. Bigger than the last. More opportunities. More places to hide. And just as much wealth. So a high demand for my interior design business. Yes, I thought of this city when I was leaving Aspen. We came here first, Christopher and I. I swallow the lump forming in my throat at the mention of his name. His daughter goes to school here, and his rich bitch ex-wife lives here. Apparently, it's full of the wealthy and famous. 
so there's plenty of opportunity for us to grow our businesses. Although I won't be in real estate for another decade or three, given Solomon's expertise at tracking. Oh, Serena. Tess shakes her head sadly. I'll do something else. I smile at them. Perhaps real estate isn't the be-all and end-all. You still have the money, most of the money your billionaire gave you. Prue shrugs. And that necklace? Charlotte smirks. I could sell it. I nod. Even though the thought of losing something he'd given me, the only thing he'd given me, feels like another knife in my heart. I chew my lip as I consider my options. Even one-tenth recompense for what the jewels were worth will set us up for a while, if we're smart. You know, I think I might have an idea, one that could use all of our skills, I say finally. Then go to it. Prue rises and stretches. I'm going to Alaska to visit that retired landscape designer who offered to take me under his wing. I'd say I'll be gone about a fortnight, unless he asks me to stay. When I get back, I'd like to see you out of the doldrums and into your new business. I'll take that as a challenge. I smile. But my smile doesn't reach my eyes. My heart still feels like it's taken a hit. I wish it were otherwise, but I miss my billionaire so much, I don't even think I'd bite him if he offered. It's not his blood now that I think of. It's not even his body. It's just him. Chapter 24 I look up from the newspaper. Ignoring the chaos of the build around me, the knocked-down walls, the smashed windows, and scowl. Usually, I flick straight to the real estate section and scour the new listings and relative values. But today, the headline on the front page and the continued story on the third page have caught my eye. It wasn't you, was it? Tess stares at the paper over my shoulder at the headline, Serial Killer Strikes Again. I shake the pages in exasperation. Of course not. Then who? You said you'd investigated this town. You said there weren't any here. I don't know, I frown, placing the paper flat on the table and extracting the real estate section. But I'll find out. We've been here four months now, and this seems to have only come up on the media radar in the last few weeks. So either someone has moved into town or the bodies were hidden well before. Or it's just a normal human murder spree. I'll have to check it out, but either way, I smirk. All you have to concentrate on is painting this house and trying not to kill Charlotte. Easier said than done. She rolls her eyes as we both laugh. This house is the first of four we'd purchased on this street. To say it needed some TLC was an understatement. It needed some major renovation on the interior. But unlike some of the others further down the line, structurally, it's fine. We intend to live in this while we work on the rest of the homes down the street. Solomon would be unlikely to look for us in an area like this, even if he did discover our new city. I'm securing another four homes tonight, effectively meaning we'll own one side of an entire street, both sides soon. It's a bad neighborhood with big blocks close to the city. Soon it will be a better neighborhood, all going to plan. Apart from the fact it's also inhabited by four vampires. Do you think Prue will be excited? Tess waves her hand around the virtual destruction zone around us. No, I laugh. But she understands the logic behind our new business. When she returns from her extended trip to Alaska, we should at least have this one finished. But then again, who knows? She might like to practice her landscaping skills on these houses before moving on to mansions. Four houses in four months. Tess shakes her head. It's madness, according to Charlotte. Charlotte underestimates us, I smirk. Now back to work. You have a hallway and a bathroom to paint. I have windows to pick up and another four houses to secure. Tess moans, turning and picking up her paintbrush. At least the hall is almost finished, but the bathroom... Ugh. Urban renewal, baby, I laugh. We're urban renewalists, if that's even a word. I prefer to be known as a property tycoon. Charlotte walks in the door with her arms full of wallpaper rolls. And I've changed my mind about the hallway. I think wallpaper will work better than paint. Oh! Tess throws her brush at Charlotte's head, but she dodges it easily, scowling at her friend. If that had hit my linen jacket. Ladies, please, I sigh. Please try to work together while I'm gone. Charlotte, you can't keep changing your mind. Tess is working hard. 
I'm going to hand over some wads of cash to some long-term residents. Then I'm going to hit some night spots. I nod in the direction of the newspaper for Charlotte's benefit. Be careful. Be good. I roll my eyes at them both. Chapter 25 I wrap up the deal with the elderly couple. Pleased I'd been able to offer them enough money to buy a retirement unit. They plan to move to a gated community, far, far away from the crime, the noise, and the gangs they fear on this street. I smile as I walk carefully back down the sidewalk towards my car. Tonight I'm wearing very high heels and a little low-cut black dress beneath my black work jacket, ready for my reconnaissance of the city's night spots. I have to take care walking on this uneven pavement. The last thing I want to do is fall over and get dirty or sprain an ankle. Although I heal more quickly than a human could, it would still hurt. As I walk towards where I parked the car, I realize that making real estate visits and deals after dark in this neck of the woods is not wise. I approach the group of four men, boys really. I estimate late teens to early twenties, leaning on my car, smoking. Up until now, I'd been relatively unmolested doing my job. Apart from a few scuffles early on with vandals on our new properties, we'd been left alone. Apparently, that's about to change. I can sense their excitement and their aggression, smell their sweat, and hear their accelerated heartbeats as I approach. Hey, beautiful lady, one of them says, stamping out his cigarette and straightening up. How about you and us? He jerks his head at his companions. Go for a ride. How about you walk away while you still can? I snort, placing my folder of paperwork on the ground and straightening up. Their harsh laughter makes me cringe inside, but I feel my mouth water at the same time, and my fangs begin to descend. It doesn't seem to matter what century you live in, men in groups, men in gangs, they always want one thing. And they always think they can get away with murder. But they're wrong. I can, though. I look over each one of the motley crew, their cheap jeans and jackets, bad haircuts, slight bodies. Easy. Too easy. Turning my eyes back to their spokesperson, their little leader, I watch with amusement as he lurches towards me, his hand in his pocket. Is that a gun? I'm only mildly interested since I intend to hurl him into the distant future shortly. Yeah, he says walking closer to me, so you better do as I say. I think not. My fangs run full out and a low growl emanates from deep down in my throat as I raise my head and look him in the eye. What the fuck? He lurches backwards, his expression fearful. Smiling, I jump forward, punching him once, hard, in the shoulder. There's a satisfying snap as his bone breaks, leaving him no choice but to keep that hand in his pocket. He screams, backing away so quickly he falls to the pavement onto his ass and scoots back like a crab as his friends run off into the night. Guess it isn't your lucky day, I smirk, hauling him up off the pavement and shoving him towards the car before turning to pick up my folder. What are you going to do to me? He squeaks. Tess speaks up from the other side of the road, her voice quiet and firm. Nothing. I sigh. I was planning on snacking on him and dumping him in one of the rather large skips I'd seen behind the local Chinese restaurant. But apparently not. Well? I look down at him where he leans against the bonnet, holding his shoulder and gasping. I can kill you quickly or slowly. Either way. I take a step towards him, narrow my eyes. You will die. Or... I shrug, walking close enough to him that he turns almost cross-eyed as he stares at my fangs. You can walk away from me, from here, alive carrying the knowledge that if you ever darken this neighborhood with your pathetic little pecker again, I'll find you. And next time, a broken arm will be the least of your worries. He nods, gulping and gasping as I grip him by the collar and give him a helping, albeit slightly violent, hand down the road. As he leaves at a lopsided hunchback run, holding his broken shoulder, I turn and look across the road, meeting Tessa's eyes. Are you following me? Yes. Do you really think I'm killing all those people downtown? No. Then? I want to come with you tonight to investigate. I promise I won't get in the way. You mean you want to babysit me in case I do decide to eat someone? She nods. 
That too. Tess, I groan and shake my head. If it's another vampire doing all this killing, I'll have to take him or her out. You might get hurt. I promise cross my heart that I'll run and hide at the very instant you tell me to. You'll get in the car and leave, no questions asked. I growl at her. Yes. Come on then, I sigh, opening my car door and signaling for her to join me. We're making our first stop at the Barbang nightclub. Here. She passes me a blood bag from her handbag. I thought you might be thirsty. I raise one eyebrow, shake my head at her, and drain the bag in a few gulps. Chapter 26 The club's pulsating with young bodies on the dance floor, all exuding pheromones and gyrating to a beat that's so loud, no human conversation could possibly be heard above it. This is the third nightclub we've visited tonight. I'm starting to grow irritable as I lean against the bar with Tess and scan the crowd, looking for any sign of someone other. We can spot another vampire easily, yet to humans we mostly blend in. It's only when they look into our eyes that they feel vaguely uncomfortable, a little frightened. But if you ask them what they feel, those are not the words they use, because they're also drawn to us in a fatalistic way. Tonight, though, I'm not here to draw in a snack, not with the virtuous fucking Tess by my side. Tonight, I'm only concentrating on finding who or what is killing a shitload of people in this nightclub district every week and doing a very poor job of disposing of their bodies. Tess looks at me over her lemon squash. We've been here two hours. I don't think he or she is here. It will be dawn soon. Maybe we can try again tomorrow night. I nod and place my martini down, prepared to leave, when something catches my attention in the darkened corner furthest from the dance floor. It looks like a couple grinding against each other up against a wall, and my eyes slide away. But I frown and look back. There's something about the way the woman is pressing herself against the man, and something about her hair that's familiar. Meet me in the car, Tess. I move to cross the dance floor to get a closer look at the couple. Just as I do, I see the woman pull away from the man as he slides down the wall, his eyes blank. Fuck. I speed up, knocking a few patrons out of the way as the woman spins and heads for the door, too fast for a human to move. As she reaches the door I slow down, prepared to follow her out into the night and deal with her quietly. But she pauses to cast a quick look back at the room, and I gasp. Valerie! Chapter 27 She sneers at the rubble all around her and glares at us. You can't keep me here! She snorts when she sees the headline on the newspaper I've placed in front of her. Valerie, why didn't you tell me Darren bit you? I was embarrassed. Embarrassed? Tess hands Valerie a warm drink, frowning as the girl sniggers and knocks it off the table. I give the kid a quick cuff across the top of the head. Ow! Yeah, so what? Why would you be embarrassed? Because he bit me here. She points to her right breast. I see. You didn't tell anyone you saw him that night, did you? That night I left you at the lodge? No. She curls her lip. Although Solomon asked if I had, he asked if I'd seen you too. I stiffen as my friends collectively draw in their breath, and I turn to them. He couldn't have known she was bitten. It was too soon for the change to take effect and the mark was hidden under her clothes. Thank goodness. Understatement. Look, Valerie. I take a deep breath. Are you responsible for all this? I point to the paper. Or is someone else hunting with you, showing you how? Hunting? Is that what you call it? No! Nobody's showing me anything. I got a fever, like really sick. And when I started to feel better, I just started to get really hungry, but I couldn't hold down food. One of my friends asked me to go to a nightclub. I started necking with some random hot guy and then... She swallows hard. I bit him. The next night I went back, and the next, I figured out I was a vampire. I mean, I've seen enough movies. I assumed real food wouldn't do any more, so... She shrugs. You have to eat. I nod. We all do. But not this way. Tess shakes her head. There are other options. You don't have to kill. Valerie grins. But I do, and I like it. Serena, a word. 
Charlotte cocks her head in the direction of the hallway, indicating I should follow her. I sigh and nod. What do you think, Char? We have to kill her. She's a loose cannon, no training, no conscience. If Solomon hasn't realized something's amiss yet, he soon will when he starts hearing news reports of mass murder in the town she lives in. No. I frown at her. We have to train her. We were all like her once, Charlotte. She shakes her head. No, we weren't. I sigh. She's right. None of us from the moment we were turned really liked killing people. Except for me, I did enjoy it at first. But Solomon with his penchant for killing young girls, torturing them for days, using them in despicable ways. His orgies of death and sex soon knocked all that out of me too. I came to realize that his type of vampire was evil, pure unadulterated evil, and I was in no way like him. Not then, not now. Yes, I kill, but I don't kill innocents. I kill those that Darwin would have preferred to be knocked out of the breeding chain. I clean up society with my predation. Vampires like Solomon. I shudder. They too should be taken out of the chain, had to be. If I couldn't convince Valerie to become a better vampire, she'd have to be eliminated too. We don't have the time, and frankly I don't have even the slightest inclination to train a new vampire. We need to end her. Char, she's all he has. It would kill him to lose her. She will kill him. I pinch my nose between my thumb and forefinger and shut my eyes, concentrating on the options. Just give me some time with her. Let me figure this out, please. It seems to me there isn't much to figure out, Serena. We have to protect ourselves before anyone else. I know she's right, but what she's suggesting, now that I know who the vampire we're dealing with is, I just can't condone. She's just a kid. I don't think she's all bad. Give me some time with her. It's nearly dawn. I'm going to bed. Do what's right, Serena. I nod, but I can't help thinking. Right for whom? Chapter 28 I knock on the front door, Valerie's forearm in my firm grip, and wait for the butler to answer. It's been three days since I caught her. I've kept her fed on blood bags and done everything in my power to convince her not to kill indiscriminately. I think I've managed to convince her to live our way of life. I hope so, because it was an unpopular decision for me to take her home. Extremely unpopular, now Prue has returned from Alaska and sided with Charlotte. It's midnight. I need to ensure Valerie's home, safe, and the waters smoothed over with her mother, before I need to get back and fix the discord in my own household. But it's not the butler who comes to the door. It's a tall blonde with a horse-like face and a nasty twist to her lips. The woman who still refers to herself as Mrs. Barrington, despite her divorce. I look her up and down. No wonder he cheated. She tears her daughter out of my grip, dragging her in the door. Oh my God, Valerie, where have you been? Your father and I have been beside ourselves with worry. Mommy? Valerie flicks me a quick look as her mother hugs her hard and turns her face to the light, holding it momentarily between the palms of her hands, searching her eyes for information. Mrs. Barrington, I murmur, giving Valerie a firm look as she tears herself away from her mother. May I come in? And you are? Valerie brushes past her and makes for the wide, heavily ornate staircase. Valerie, I call out, watching as she spins her foot on the second step. Remember what I said? She vaults up the stairs way too fast, calling over her shoulder. Sure, I'll remember. I turn my attention back to the cow before me. I'm a former business associate of your ex-husband's, and I'd like to come in and talk to you about your daughter. Is that what you call yourself these days? A business associate? I saw you. I saw you on the jet with Christopher when he stopped to pick up Valerie for Aspen. You're no business associate. On the contrary. I was his real estate agent. You are nothing, nothing to me, nothing to my daughter. And now here you are, expecting the reward for her return, no doubt. Reward? I frown. Don't act so innocent. Her father posted a $2 million reward for any information regarding her whereabouts. It's been broadcast on every television channel in the country since the moment she disappeared. I don't watch television. I found your daughter in a nightclub. 
Valerie said she ran away three weeks ago. Do you have any idea where she's been living or what she's been doing all that time? How dare you remonstrate me for how I'm raising my... I'm not remonstrating you, Miss Barrington, I interrupt. I'm telling you that your daughter was lost, and now she's found. She won't be lost soon. She's overdue to attend finishing school in Switzerland. She was expected there last week. She'll fly out first thing in the morning. And in the meantime, the public story will be that she was at a friend's house. A typical teenager thing to do, regardless of where she actually was. If you or anyone else suggests otherwise, I'll see you discredited. I furiously try to sort out my thoughts. Of course, image is everything, you stupid bitch. But school overseas? I frown. Valerie hadn't said anything about this. She had, in fact, promised me she'd visit every four days for regular blood bag supplies and otherwise be staying home. Shit. Won't her father want to see her first? That's none of your concern. Mrs. Barrington, I'm not sure being away from home is the best thing for your daughter right now. Good night. I stand staring at the door as it slams in my face, wondering what I should do. I've done my best. But if Valerie can't control her thirst because she has no access to blood, then all my brainwashing and persuasion will be to no avail. I turn back to the waiting taxi and think through what I'll tell my friends when I get home. Chapter 29 No, 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 I moan, my head in my hands, the evening's breaking news having flashed across my laptop as soon as I opened it. My moaning, unnoticed by my housemates, is interrupted by a frantic knocking on the door. Rising, I open it and step back as a tearful and hysterical Valerie tumbles into the room, her face a red, crumpled, and mascara-run mess. Tell me you didn't do it, I groan. I did! I did! She throws herself into my arms, sobbing. I killed her! Oh, Christ. I don't add what I'm thinking. That I really couldn't blame her. I hold the sobbing girl in my arms and look over her head as Charlotte, Prue, and Tess enter the room. What now? I nod towards the laptop, saying nothing as they read the headline. Society Darling Found Dead in Mansion. Prue raises an eyebrow, but doesn't look surprised. I gather Mrs. Barrington will be found to have suffered a throat injury? Valerie's sobs grow louder. How did the media get there so fast? I called the ambulance and then I ran. You might need to leave this to me. Prue's intent is clear as she nods to Valerie where she remains sheltered in my arms, her wet face buried in my shirt. No, I shake my head. Valerie, I pull her away and hold her at arm's length. Tell us what happened. I couldn't control myself. She wanted to send me away, to Switzerland. She started shouting at me. I got so angry, so horribly out of control mad. My fangs came out, and she started screaming and throwing things at me, and I, I pushed her. Only, I pushed her too hard, and she fell down the stairs. She fell and... Okay, hush, okay, it was an accident. It was a terrible accident. No! She shakes her head. Because... Because I picked her up, she wasn't breathing. I... I panicked, but... I... I still drank her blood. I drank her blood. I drank her blood! I sigh and slap her hard, but not excessively hard, across the face, and her cries stop instantly, reverting to loud hiccups. You didn't mean to. I look up to Tess and nod. This isn't the first time I'd have to help a contrite vampire cover up a cause of death. Not by a long shot. As far as anyone should know, Mrs. Barrington tripped down the stairs and hit her head. No one can know she was also bitten. No one. City Morgue. Tess nods. The records department is part of my job. It won't be a problem. It never is. But this time we have a bigger problem. She points to Valerie. One we should have solved a week ago. I shake my head. Valerie, how do you feel about what you did? Are you crazy? How do you think I feel? I don't know. I gently lead her to the couch. I want you to tell me. I love her. Ugh, I loved her. She's my mom. She was, I mean... She begins to cry again. I feel terrible. I hate what I've become. Hate it. You told me I could live a normal life, drinking from blood bags, and I believed you. I believed you, and look what I did. Valerie, 
Charlotte moves to sit near the girl. You need to use this pain, this horrible feeling you have, to come to grips with what you are, to ensure you never do anything like this again to someone undeserving. We've all killed and regretted it, even me. But we use that feeling, that disgust with ourselves and our sorrow, to ensure we better control our anger, better target our sippies. Valerie sniffs. Sippies? We don't just drink from blood bags. We can live like that. Tess does. But some of us still hunt. I was going to teach you over the coming weeks, hone your thirst, given that you enjoy drinking from humans. But it looks like I've run out of time. What are you going to do to me? I look up at Charlotte and across to Prue, and finally to Tess. I don't know. Chapter 30 He sits opposite me, legs crossed, whiskey tumbler in hand, and stares. Every part of me wants to curl up on his lap and beg him to look at me as he once did, with lust, amusement, and admiration. But his eyes now radiate only fear and disgust. Who can blame him? The woman he reviled as a whore has now just revealed she's a blood-sucking monster. But it had to be done to save Valerie's life. For him. It had to be done. I know now, as he stares at me, that I've lost him forever. Sacrificed any possible future with this gorgeous man. So that he could have a life with his daughter. And yet, what future could we have had anyway? He doesn't want to bed me now that he knows I was a whore. Being a vampire is just the icing on the cake. The girls are right. This is for the best. And you kill people? It's the second time he's asked me this. Yes. And Valerie will too, I think. It's in some of our natures more than others. She's driven, determined, pragmatic, and has a healthy disrespect for authority. She has all the characteristics of someone who will. Someone like you? Yes. And like her father. I smile gently. She'll take what she wants, when she wants it, and damn the consequences. It's only a matter of time. Is that how you perceive me? Christopher, I shake my head. Never mind. He takes a sip of his drink. You're here to discuss my daughter. Let's get down to business. If it wasn't you who did this to her, who was it? It was one of your business associates. I sigh heavily. A man who is in the entourage of someone called Solomon. I see his jaw clench as he looks away from me momentarily before staring down into his drink. Tell me. I'll start from the beginning. It may help you make sense of this mess. Help you to understand what Valerie is going through, will go through. I pause and he nods for me to go on. I was 22 when I met him. I stop to take a deep gulp of my whiskey and set the empty glass to the side. And I was working, as he so rightly told you, as a prostitute. I was born into the trade. My mother sold my virginity to the highest bidder when I was ten. From the age of twelve, I had regular clients. I stayed working for her until the night Solomon walked into her brothel. I see his shoulders stiffen, and I look away. I need to keep my eyes off him if I'm going to tell him everything. Otherwise, his expression might stop my words for good. He took my life that night, my human life, when he took my body. He bit me, hard, on the neck, sucked some of my blood, I think, and promised me he would return for me three nights later. I was terrified. He was cruel. His pleasures were unusual. I didn't want to see him again. But true to his word, he came back. My mother didn't want me to leave. I was a good earner for her. So he drained every last drop of her blood and threw her body onto the midden pile in the back street. When I looked out, I saw the bodies of every woman who had worked in our brothel. Every single one. There were 32 of us. I pause and rise, pouring myself another drink, before resuming my story, my back to him. Then the real horror began. Solomon maintained a high lifestyle a very high lifestyle, and that was sustained through attracting and retaining the friendships and business partnerships of the rich and famous. Nothing has changed there. I spin and give Christopher a sad smile. And part of his attraction was his hospitality, the broad range of amusements that he could offer. Any deviant desire a wealthy man had Solomon could accommodate, 
and many he introduced the wealthy to. This centered around sex, of course. He'd collected me and a cadre of other attractive women to work for him, ensuring his guests had their every whim satisfied. We were also used to capture his prey. And his prey, well, he had other pleasures. Small children, girls and boys, but girls mostly. He enjoyed hurting them, and his powerful friends, the rich, the royal, they enjoyed this too. I drift off for a moment, my thoughts almost too painful to voice, but I look up, meeting Christopher's gaze, and go on. I was his prisoner for more than one hundred years. During that time, he also collected several women who would become very dear to me. One, Tess, was sensitive. So sensitive. She was a pretty little milkmaid when he caught her, and her simple life up till then had given her no coping mechanisms for anything that she was put through in Solomon's world. Charlotte was a high society darling. He took her on a whim, and Prue, she was a flower girl in the slums of London. We became friends. We supported one another and shielded each other from him where we could. And one day he let us go. Why would he do that? Christopher rises and walks to stare out the window. A game, I think. I shrug. He was bored and jaded, and I offered him an interesting diversion. He thought he would track and dispose of us after a short hunt, but he was wrong. Every time he got close, every country he tracked us to, he was just a bit slower, a bit off the mark. And we'd learned something from him, although we didn't want to admit it. I swallow hard. I'm determined to tell him everything. I want no more secrets. I want him to know all there is to know. At first, we were poor, so very poor. You don't know poverty and desperation until you've lived through the early 1700s with nothing but the clothes on your back. We didn't want to kill anyone, you see. Tess especially didn't want any more blood on her hands. So, we drank from animals where we could. But back then, everyday people measured their wealth in livestock and often slept with their animals in their homes. We got jobs where we could. Charlotte could read and write. Prue and Tess could work the fields, and I, I did what I knew how to do best. Whoring? Yes, I slept with men. At first, anyone who would pay me enough to buy the animals we needed to eat. Later, as we could afford finer clothes for me, I moved up in my clientele, charging more. Still later, I targeted those very high up, killing where I needed to, taking money and gaining positions for my friends in high places. We learned how to gain wealth from the powerful. But always, we were on the run. Over the centuries, I've killed many of Solomon's minions. He hasn't caught us. But he caught my daughter. Yes, but I don't think he meant to. Valerie said she was meeting Darren for kisses, high school petting, nothing more. Oh, Solomon meant it all right. He spins to me, his eyes blazing. I was winding down my business with him. This was to be his last year as my guest at Aspen. He wanted a billion-dollar deal. I offered him nothing. By having his man bite my daughter... He was taking something from me just as I was taking something from him. Oh, I pale. Then he sent Darren to kill Valerie. It makes sense. But he doesn't know Darren Bitter, I frown, because he would have claimed her as his own by now, taken her for his plaything. If he really wanted to hurt you, you would never have seen her again. How couldn't he know? Her disappearance and my ex-wife's death have been plastered on every newsstand and television program in the country. Your daughter's disappearance was announced as a mere teenage prank, I remind him, and your wife fell and hit her head. But Valerie told me she killed her. She did, I nod, but the morgue records won't show that. Christ, do I even want to know? He runs his hand through his hair in agitation and lurches back to the window. You have means and ways of getting around red tape to get what you want. I shrug. So do we. Don't act like it's somehow unpalatable to you. I sit quietly, watching his broad shoulders, my eyes moving to his narrow hips and the cut of his pants as he stands silently, thinking through all I've told him. God, I've missed this man. Even now, his blood smells divine. I haven't seen him for so long that I'm no longer used to it inured to it, able to resist so easily. It's taking all my strength not to launch myself at him. He stands, his back still to me, and speaks quietly. I should thank you. 
reward you. You've saved my daughter's life. I don't want your money, Christopher. I frown, my anger beginning to rise. At first I did, but for an honest day's work finding you a house, not for sleeping with you. Now nothing on earth would make me take a penny from you. You misunderstand. He spins, frowning. Look about what I said. On the phone. Forget it, I rise. I'm sure I don't need to tell you that you can't ever reveal the existence of my kind to anyone. He nods. Keep your daughter close. You have the means to provide her with a regular blood bag supply, and she has my number. Just keep an eye on her. She's still a teenager. She'll still have days where she just wants to go crazy and kill everyone. Don't they always? He chuckles half-heartedly, shaking his head. Yeah, I laugh gently. But this one really can do it now. You can call me whenever you need advice, or... I leave the word hanging. For a moment, his face looks pained, but he strides to the door and holds it open for me. Take care, Serena. I nod and leave. My tears start as I step into the elevator, but I dry them hastily when I hear my name called. Spinning, I press the button to keep the door open as I see him striding down the hallway towards me. When he reaches me, he stands too close, as he always does. Bring them all here. Your friends. You can all live here in Aspen. I'll ramp up my security one hundredfold. I can keep you and Valerie safe. You can live on the other side of the lodge. We never need see one another. I try not to show how hurt I am by his last words. Does he really hate me that much? So much that he doesn't even want to see my face? Am I that repulsive to him? No, thank you. I shake my head. I'm sure you can keep Valerie safe. Solomon will have worked out by now that I killed Darren. My friends and I are safer where we are, being able to run when we need to. I wish you well, Mr. Barrington. He stares into my eyes, searching, but obviously doesn't find what he's looking for, as he nods briskly and steps back, and the elevator doors close. Chapter 31 Nice rocks. Charlotte smirks as she enters my new office and sees the emerald and diamond collar back around my throat. I smile. It's taken six months of hard work on houses, work that was still going on, but I'd managed to get the collar Christopher had bought for me out of hock. Call it vanity, call it sentimentality, call it stupidity. But I wanted it, not only for its beauty and value, but because it reminded me of him, of the one man in a million I'd fallen for. Now, looking around my ugly but fully paid-for new office, I can't help but feel a little positive about the future. We're actually making headway in our new endeavor. Heartbreak aside. Do you like the sign on the wall outside? I grin at Charlotte. Dark Knight's Urban Renewal? She laughs. Yes, I love our new business name. I'm not so fond, though, of having to deal with the builder you chose last week. I've spoken to him twice on the phone, and I want to rip his head off already. Charlotte, I scowl at her. You're the interior designer, but you have to work with the builders closely. Stop trying to change things at the last minute and micromanage them. Jesus, I've lost three in the past three months. If you keep this up, we'll have gone through all the builders in town. This one comes highly recommended. I've seen his work, and I'm telling you to compromise and keep him with us. Oh, blah, blah. She scowls. Enough with the lecture. You've said it a hundred times. I'll work with this builder. And no biting. Yes, yes. She waves her hand in the air. The last one tasted horrible anyway. Charlotte? I gaze at her ominously. I promise no biting this builder. Although since we've only communicated by phone to date, I can't see how that'll happen anyway. He starts next week. He's on some biking tour. But come Monday, you need to be on your best behavior. Best behavior? She pokes her tongue out at me. How's your new office? It'll take some serious redecorating. She groans as I begin to giggle. And my secretary is the stupidest woman on earth. I beg to differ. I'll bet you a hundred bucks that my secretary is the stupidest woman on earth. Prue walks in with an arm full of files. No, that would be mine. Tess shouts from the room next door. Hey, I heard that. Prue laughs. Jokes, just jokes. I'm glad I'm only the temporary secretary for your landscape design business, Prue. 
because when you get your own office downtown, I'm going to take great delight in interviewing your new staffer. And then you'll really know stupid. I'll hire the dumbest person I can find, like, retarded stupid. I shake my head and answer my phone. Valerie. I smile. My friends drift out of my office. They know I enjoy talking to the girl and counseling her. None of them really agreed with me sparing her life or revealing our own predilection towards night feeding. Prue, in particular, was still a little angry with me, despite me bribing her by purchasing a new office just for her fledgling landscape business. Unlike mine, it's in a swanky area downtown. How's it going, Val? All good. Although I'm a little lonely with Daddy still on his trip. Oh? I try not to ask about her father. It feels like a dagger in my heart every time I hear his name. But my curiosity gets the better of me. Business trip? They usually don't take too long. No, he went on a boating trip with Uncle Tristan. He said he needed to clear his head and think through some things. He always does this when he's in a real bind. Uncle Tristan? I murmur. Your father's younger brother? You could say that. She giggles. And he's the nice one, so I hope he can deal with Daddy. He's been like a bear with a sore head ever since you left me here. I'm sure he'll find the trip refreshing and plenty of diversions. If you mean another mistress, you're wrong. There's been no one since you. I didn't ask that. I let my displeasure seep through the line. You didn't need to. She giggles again. I shake my head and take a deep breath. I know it's just wishful thinking that this boat trip might end as the last one did, with him coming into my office and asking me to go away with him. Not that I would. No, that ship, pun intended, has sailed. I listen to Veronica's chatter for a little while longer, thank her for the flowers she sent to congratulate us on our new office and formal business name, and get down to work. I have houses to buy, houses to sell, and whole suburbs to redevelop and sell at a huge profit. It's easy, once you have money in the bank, to make money. And there's a great deal of money to be made renovating and turning over old homes in this vast city, ripe for renewal. If only I could just renovate my heart as easily, mend the cracks and holes left by my billionaire. But apparently, something like that's a little harder to fix. Maybe I just need to harden it again, turn my love for this man into anger and hatred. Maybe then, it'll return to its usual glass-hard state. I'll work on it. Chapter 32 Ms. Danube, there's a man here to see you. Does he have an appointment? I frown as I flick through my diary. Did I miss something? No. Fuck. She is the world's dumbest secretary. How long has it been? Six weeks? Six weeks, and she still can't do the basics. Christ, surely I win the bet with Charlotte and Prue? Surely mine is the stupidest. Then I don't wish to see him, Maria. Tell him I'm busy today and set an appointment for a week from tomorrow. Okay, it's just... Just what? He doesn't seem like the kind of man to take no for an answer. Maria, if I have to come out there... I leave my words hanging ominously. Eek! Never mind. She hangs up. I swear I'm going to eat her one of these days. I rise, close my diary, and pick up my leather work folder. A week in the mountains is calling. I can't stand another night in this office. And then there's the issue of Charlotte, not answering my calls after apparently slamming a door in the face of the new builder, refusing to work with him under any circumstance. Maybe a week away will do her good, too. Still shaking my head at my secretary's incompetence, I round the desk and freeze as my door bangs open, and I see who's striding in. He halts a few steps away from my desk, hands in pockets, hair mussed from the strong winds outside. He's in jeans, and that blue jumper he wore the last time he'd returned from a boat trip. And he has a scruffy beard. He looks so fuckable. I could come just staring at him. His scent hits me like a wrecking ball. I close my eyes. I know I'm fooling myself to think I could ever hate this man. Everything about him draws me towards him. Everything. Miss Danube. Sighing, I shake my head and open my eyes. Mr. Barrington. I'm moving to this city. I believe you might be able to help me find my new home. Mr. Barrington, 
I straighten my shoulders and raise my chin, meeting his gaze resolutely. I am no longer a real estate agent, and I doubt very much that I can offer you anything you might desire. I think you know exactly what I desire. Like I said, I frown at him as I try to ignore the smell of his cologne and his hot, hot blood while discerning the double meaning behind his words. That's unlikely. I'm looking for a brutally honest woman with a penchant for warm-blooded meals and a good right hook. His eyes search mine. Anywhere she is is home. My long, cold, dead heart misses a metaphorical beat. Can it be true? Can he feel for me the way I feel about him? After all we've been through? After all this time? I clear my throat. I gather your fishing trip went well? It did. My brother has a way of clarifying things for me. Things that are usually right in front of my nose. Things I'm too hard-headed, or stupid, or blind to see. And what might he have helped you see? That I was a fool. That I treated you terribly for something in your past that you had no control over. That life without you is no life that I want to live. That Valerie and I need you. Christopher. I take a deep breath, preparing to do what I must. I'm not going to become your mistress. I can't endure you disappearing every time something about me or my past is revealed. There's still so much you don't know. I don't care, and I don't want another mistress. Oh? I was thinking since the title of Mrs. Barrington is now vacant. He swallows, his eyes never leaving mine. That you and I might agree to something more permanent. Christopher, I shake my head. I'm immortal. Danger follows me. Hell, I'm a danger to you. It's not safe to be around me. And I'm not wife material. I decide who I consider to be wife material, Ms. Danube. And I didn't get to where I am now by being safe. I know what I want. I know I've hurt you. I'll make it up to you, if you'll let me try. Well then, I turn to my desk, carefully placing my folder down and desperately trying to collect my racing thoughts, before slowly turning back to him and meeting his eyes. Whatever he sees in mine galvanizes him into action. He closes the distance between us, placing his hands on my hips, hoisting up my skirt and lifting me, in one smooth motion, onto my desk. I swallow hard, memories of our encounter that night in the kitchen resurfacing, making my blood boil with desire and anticipation. I look deep into his eyes. So you're saying you want to spend your life with me, Mr. Barrington? It's the only time I'm going to give you, Miss Danube. He leans close, his lips against my ear. Make it count. The End. Our story continues in Book 2 of the Bite series. Don't Bite the Builder.